Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to Alachua County's Community-Wide Transportation Summit. It's my pleasure to be here with you this evening. My name is Carol Lippincott, and I'm the facilitator of this transportation workshop. And I want to thank each of you for taking the time to be here to begin a community-wide dialogue about the future of transportation in Alachua County. Now the county commission is seated up, seated up here and the commission's intent for this transportation purpose, or, excuse me, the transportation summit is to begin that community-wide dialogue by hearing this evening from you. Tonight we're going to gather public input and we're going to fill this room with your ideas about transportation. The intent of this summit is to begin that community-wide dialogue on developing a transportation system for Alachua County that makes Alachua County a place where people like to live and work. And that's the commission's intent for this summit. Now the specific purpose of this summit is to begin that dialogue by gathering your input. And the, the commission wants to hear about the characteristics of a transportation system for a hypothetical community in which you would like to live and work? And what are the most important steps that you believe need to happen starting now to build that transportation system in Alachua County? The County Commission is here tonight to listen to you. They are exercising their leadership as listeners this evening. Would you all like to stand and acknowledge that? <laughs> Listeners. <clears throat> um, a few words about my role as a facilitator. I'm a professional facilitator. Um, I, my services this evening are provided by the county manager's office. I live here in Gainesville and I work throughout Florida facilitating groups and meetings to help them achieve their meeting purpose. I guide public meetings like this Primarily, my role in public meetings like this is to assure that the public meetings are fair and open, and most importantly, that public meetings like this are a safe place for everyone to express their views. People feel safe to speak. So my job as facilitator of this transportation summit is to make sure that you, which includes all of you in the room, um, are heard tonight, and that you feel safe to speak and are safe to speak. Now, as facilitator, I'm independent, I'm content neutral. I guide the processes of the meeting to help you do what you came here to do, which is to provide your input to express your ideas on transportation. You determine the content of the summit. I'm content neutral. You're the content people. I'm working tonight on behalf of everyone in the room to assure that we accomplish the intent and purpose of the Transportation Summit. So, by the end of the summit, everyone who wishes to express their views on transportation will have had the opportunity to do so. And by the end of the summit, you will have been heard and hopefully you'll feel that your time here was well spent and you'll feel that you really are part of shaping the transportation future for Alachua County. Okay. Another note, this is a publicly noticed county commission meeting, a publicly noticed city commission meeting. And as such, the meeting is being recorded, both audio and video. And the video of this meeting will be posted on the county's website after the summit. Now I'd like to introduce the Alachua County Manager, Mr. Richard Drummond, for his uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> can everyone hear me? Normally I wouldn't use the mic, but that's the only way it can get recorded. And I got a short cord, so I can't even walk around with it. That's no fun. Um, I'm Rick Drummond, the county manager. Um, pleased to be here. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we were wondering when we chose this topic if we'd have any interest in, the, in, in coming out. And apparently it was a good topic to, to choose for a, a night like tonight. And we really appreciate you being here 
Um, as, as Carol mentioned, this is a, we're looking at this as a new beginning. We've had conversation after conversation after conversation about transportation, what our needs are, and, and how are we going to meet those needs in the future. We think that we have an opportunity as a community to come together. We're not starting from any specific point. Those of us who've been involved, we all know what's happened in the past. The past is not necessarily prologue, it's, it's the past. So we are looking tonight for everybody here to um, provide your perspective. Some of you are representing groups, some of you are speaking on your own behalf. We invite everybody to participate and provide that information. There will not be any decisions, there will not be any debate tonight. The County Commission is here. We've noticed it as a, as a uh, officially as a public meeting, as, as Carol mentioned, for both the City Commission and the County Commission, because we wanted all of the commissioners to have the opportunity to be here. And so to make sure we weren't violating the sunshine, we're gonna, we noticed it. However, they're not going to convene at the end of the meeting and start to make decisions and sort through this. It's just information gathering. We have scheduled a follow-up meeting, which will be in the commission chambers, and we'll notify if you've given your um, uh, contact information. Many of you, we have it anyway. When you signed in today, you will all get formal notice of it, but I'll tell you right now, the follow-up meeting will be in the county commission chambers on June 4th at uh, 5 p.m. And at that time, we will provide them, from the facilitator and staff, will provide them a recap of what you, what you all say tonight. I mean, they'll, they'll remember and so on and so forth, and we'll get all that information together and then begin the actual public dialogue in terms of where do we go from here. And there will be many meetings that will occur, both at the commission chambers, workshops out in the community. We don't have a schedule set up yet. A lot of that will depend on what we hear tonight, what comes out of the meeting, um, whether the county commission is gonna be the driving force moving forward with any initiative, or whether community groups are gonna step up and offer to step forward um, and be the driving force on uh, any initiative uh, it, in terms of what's, what, uh, what the community has identified as its needs and how we might meet those needs. So tonight is information gathering. No decisions will be made, no debate. Dr. Lippincott will be making sure that, that as she said, everyone has the opportunity um, to make their presentation today and there, there'll be no interaction in that sense where people will say, what do you think about this? And, and so on and so forth. Just state your position, what you believe you think is important, and how we can get to where we need to go. And, um, and then the county commission will take that information and at that June 4th meeting, begin the true public back and forth discourse of sorting through all of your ideas and, and, and determine what the best avenue or avenues are to make it all come to fruition. So that's where we are, and I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Carol. She will take you through how we're gonna do this tonight, and uh, looking forward to what everyone has to say. Even if you think it's already been said, take this as a starting point. Get it out there, get the information there, get the ideas out in the, in the public realm and, uh, and let's begin this conversation again. Carol, you want to take it over from here? Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'd like to start out by seeing who's here. And the first group that I'd like to actually stand, if you are here, are any elected officials from local governments in Alachua County, including the county commission. If you would stand if you're an elected official from any local governments in Alachua County. If we could quickly go around and just identify yourself, I know you're going to want to make a speech, but if you would just identify yourself, and starting with Commissioner Hutchison.
Excellent. Thank you so much, you all, for attending. Um, raise your hand if you're staff from a municipality, a local government in Alachua County. Local governments or municipalities or Alachua County. Good. Okay, staff members. Raise your hand if you're a member of a community group, representing a community group this evening. Raise your hand. Real high. Real high. Good. Raise your hand if you are a member of the general public, which means you aren't specifically with any community group. General public, get your hands up. Um, raise your hand if you're here representing University of Florida or Santa Fe College. Good. Good. All right. And here's an interesting one. Any non-residents of Alachua County? You are not a resident of Alachua County. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, a quick agenda review. First, um, I'll spend actually about 15 minutes reviewing the meeting processes and how this meeting will work for you. And after that, we'll hear from the municipalities and the community groups who accepted the county's invitation to reserve a speaker spot. Those are 10-minute speaker spots. We'll hear from those municipalities and community groups, and then we'll take a break so that you call, can stretch and mingle and get to know each other. And then after the break, we'll hear from anyone else who wants to speak on transportation issues until everyone's spoken. And then um, I will work with you to review and summarize what we've heard, and uh, the county manager will close the summit. So that's the agenda. Um, note in that agenda, there's no time for questions or comments because tonight is all about gathering your public input. As I said, filling the room with your ideas about transportation. The opportunity to comment and question and discuss will be started, begun, at the June 4th County Commission meeting. So. Um, we want to make sure that the county commission tonight is listening to you when you're speaking. So to make sure that they're not listening to the cell phone ringing in your pocket, would everybody please take their cell phones out now and put them in silent mode. And if you have to take a call, if you would please leave the room so that you don't interrupt the other speakers. Okay, good. People are doing it. Great. Um, first item of process, if you want to speak, during the open public comment period after the break, please fill out a speaker card, and we have a table back with speaker cards, and turn it in tonight. The speakers will be called in the order in which the speaker cards are turned in. So those who turn their speaker cards in early will get to speak earlier, and those who turn their speaker cards in later will get to speak later. So turn your speaker cards in there. Now, if you choose not to speak this evening, but you would still like to provide your comments to the commission in a written format, you can fill out a written comment card, which is at the round table in the back. And you can either fill them out this evening and turn them in, or you can take it home and mail it back to the county staff. The address is on the comment card. So you can speak tonight, or you can provide written comments tonight or later. Also, there's a third way that you can provide your public comment to the Commission on Transportation Issues, and that is through an online survey that will be posted after the summit. And the survey questions will be similar to the questions that are asked this evening. So you have three ways of participating in this public input. You can speak tonight, you can fill out a written comment card, or you can fill in the online survey after the summit. So three different ways, it's all your choice. Okay, let's talk about why we're here tonight. And you know the purpose of the summit. It's to gather public input. And at the end of the summit, the county will have a lot of information. They'll have the audio recordings. They'll have your written public comment, comment cards. They'll have the survey comments that anybody chooses to fill in. Lots of tangible products. And the county staff will take that input and they'll summarize it, and you can actually analyze it, and they'll be presenting it to the county commission at the June 4th meeting. And those are all the very tangible products that will come out of the summit. But what's interesting about my work and interesting about meetings is that often, in addition to the stated meeting purpose, which is obvious to everybody, usually, there are often other meeting purposes that aren't so obvious, aren't so apparent to really anybody. And that's what we look for. We look for the things that need to happen at a meeting in order for the meeting to be a success in addition to the stated purposes, these other less obvious purposes. And the less obvious purposes 
usually don't have to do with those tangible things, things you walk away with holding in your hand. These less obvious meeting purposes often have to do with intangible things like, how does this group think after a meeting? Or how does this group feel after a meeting? Like, uh, after a meeting, uh, is the group more confident about something? Or after a meeting, is the group more enthusiastic about something? Do they know something that they didn't know before and is useful to them? Those are the kind of intangible things that can come out of a meeting that can often be as important as the stated purpose. And so that's what we look for as facilitators when we begin a job. We ask, what's the purpose of this meeting? And then we try to determine well, what other things need to happen to make the meeting a success. So uh, at the beginning of this job, I did an assessment of transportation issues in Alachua County with um, two ideas in mind. One was to look for these other purposes, the other things that need to happen to make it a success, and also to just understand the issues. I don't know much about transportation, so I needed to understand just the lingo and the acronyms. And in that assessment, I did discover what I think are two other really important purposes of this summit. And I want to tell you about those purposes, but I think the best way to start, by tell it, start telling you about those is to tell you what I learned about transportation in my assessment. And I learned four very general things. And many of you in the room are going to think that these are patently obvious. But these four things were interesting to me in terms of kind of framing the issue and where this community is. And the first thing I learned about transportation in Alachua County is that this community has a wealth of ideas about transportation. You people feel strongly about transportation and you are totally engaged on transportation. So that is not a problem. That's the first thing I learned about transportation in Alachua County. The second thing I learned is that the local governments in Alachua County, especially Alachua County government and the city of Gainesville, they already have these very interconnected transportation plans that are in place and which they're implementing as funding allows. So that's the second thing I learned about transportation. Plans are in place and they're doing it where they have the money. The third thing I learned is that transportation's really expensive and meeting the transportation needs that are already identified in this community is going to cost a whole lot. And if there are delays, those same transportation needs down the road will cost a whole, whole, whole lot more. And I know that's not very quantitative, but transportation is really expensive. So we have a wealth of ideas, there's plans in place, but transportation's expensive. And number four, there isn't enough funding right now to meet the identified transportation needs in Alachua County. So those are the four things I learned. But I kept in my assessment and in my readings and my interviews, I kept hearing about the funding issue. You know, we, we have ideas, we have plans, but it's expensive and there's not enough money, we need more funding. So I asked the question, how has this community funded other really expensive projects that they thought were a priority? And the answers that I got, what I learned is that in the last about dozen years or so, Alachua County voters have voted six times to increase taxes to fund expensive projects that they considered to be important. And those six things were schools, this is not in any order, schools once, schools twice, then there was health care for the poor and choices, there was a courthouse, there was buying conservation lands and parks. So six times in the last dozen or so years, Alachua County voters said, yeah, we want to fund those important priorities, we'll um, pass this tax referendum. Now in the same dozen years, you know what happened. Is Alachua County voters over the past dozen or so years or so have said no twice to transportation initiatives to fund transportation through some kind of tax, twice. And it's a bit of an elephant in the room that the last time that Alachua County voters rejected a tax to fund transportation was just five months ago. 
And it was a resounding no, with two out of three voters saying, no, this is not acceptable to us. So what my assessment suggests is that this community is stuck when it comes to transportation, really stuck. And that led to other questions like, why is this community stuck, so stuck, when it comes to transportation? And another question was, what has this community learned from the past two failed efforts to pass transportation initiatives? And then the big question is, how is this summit, this new dialogue, going to be any different than in the past? Well, it brings up all those questions. And that brings me to the second purpose of the summit that I discovered in, re in doing the assessment of the situation. And I think that an important need of this summit, a purpose, is to begin building this community's trust in this new transportation initiative. And let me explain what I mean by begin building this community's trust. It means building trust that this dialogue, the reason you're here this evening, really is, you know, this, that this dialogue truly welcomes the full diversity of voices in this community, building trust on that. Another area of trust is building trust that this new initiative really will be fair and open and honest and inclusive. And building trust that an outcome of this dialogue has not already been determined. And Lastly, building trust that this community really does have a voice in shaping the transportation future of Alachua County. So I think that's the second purpose of this meeting is building trust. And as a facilitator, I'm going to do my job to make sure that tonight this is an open, fair, honest, inclusive forum. That's my job. And hopefully by the end of the summit this evening, you'll feel that this is a process that you can trust and you'll feel motivated about becoming part of it. That's my hope and that's my job. But you have a job here too tonight. And your job this evening is to actively participate in this summit in ways that build trust. To actively participate in this summit in ways that help this community to get unstuck when it comes to transportation. So that brings me back to the stuck part and the unstuck part. And I think that the other purpose of this summit is for each of you to answer the question, how will I help this community to get unstuck when it comes to transportation? I think that's the third purpose. So we're gonna gather public input, hopefully we'll build trust that this is meaningful, and each of you is going to, to ask that question of yourself and hopefully come up with an answer. Now, Certainly that's up to each of you, whether you want to go there, but the whole concept of helping groups to get unstuck is what facilitators and mediators all around the world do. And there's a familiar way for groups to get unstuck if they choose to do so. And we know about these methods because there are case studies from across the United States, from across the world of groups and communities dealing with really, really tough issues, and they are getting unstuck. And they're having breakthroughs, and in some communities, they're doing some really remarkable things in these case studies. And the way that these communities and these groups are getting unstuck is by shifting their mindset. Now, what does that mean? When groups are stuck, when people are stuck on a really tough issue, there's a very typical mindset, the stuck mindset, that they get locked into. And I'll read you some characteristics of that stuck mindset. This is a competition, a battle. It's either us or them. Someone has to lose and it won't be us. This is the stuck mindset. This is survival of the powerful, the loudest, and the most aggressive. We bargain from our rock-solid positions and we do not budge. We know best, we 
we're not really interested in what other people have to say, and don't confuse us with new information. And lastly, we want this to happen quickly and to happen our way. That's the stuck mindset. Now, in contrast, these case studies from around the country and around the world of communities that are getting unstuck, they're adopting, they're working hard to adopt an unstuck mindset. And here are some of the qualities of this unstuck mindset in contrast to the stuck mindset. This isn't a competition or a battle. This is a community-wide effort, and our community is depending on us. It's not us or them, it's got to be us and them because continuing to fight them isn't getting us what we need. There don't have to be winners and losers. We can have winners and winners if we try to fit in more people's needs. We don't bargain from inflexible, rigid positions. We negotiate to meet our deeper interests. We don't know all the answers. We're willing to try to listen to other people, and uh, we're willing to consider new information. And then lastly, and this is important, we take as long as it takes to get most of the people on board. So that's the unstuck mindset, and I'm watching the facial expressions out here, and I'm seeing some interesting facial expressions, because I know to some of you this unstuck mindset thing seems like asking way too much. Yep, I see some bobbing heads. Now, shifting your mindset isn't easy, but remember, it's working in other communities, it's working in other groups. But it's most important when, it is, when you're facing really complicated issues like this. Complica issues that are very complex, like transportation issues, issues where people have a lot to gain or lose. Is that the case here? a lot to gain or lose, issues where people can't agree on a solution, is that the case here? And issues where, in the end, you need a lot of people to buy in if you're ever going to move forward. That's when it's worth the effort to consider the possibility of shifting your mindset. And from a process facilitator's perspective, when I look at this issue kind of from the outside, what I see is that it's the mindset of everyone in this room, everyone in the community that's going to determine if Alachua County stays stuck when it comes to transportation. And if this community decides to stay stuck, stay in that stuck mindset, then this summit and this dialogue is just the start of another failed effort. However, you can decide to try to shift your mindset and to try looking at things differently and be part of the beginning of something, have this summit be the beginning of a real breakthrough for transportation in Alachua County and a real breakthrough for this community. So again, I think that third purpose of the summit is for each of you to answer the question, how will I help this community to get unstuck when it comes to transportation? And just so that you don't forget We've made a poster that will be here to remind you about what may be the most important job you have this evening. Okay, that was a long framing. That was a big framing. Now getting on to the processes of this meeting. I'll talk about the meeting processes, one, two minutes, and then the guidelines for public comment so that you're all feeling safe. Tonight we have 13 speakers from municipalities or local governments who accepted the county's invitation to reserve a speaker spot. Those are 10 minute speaker spots. Now, to you speakers, that 10 minutes may either seem like a really long time or not nearly time enough, but remember, hit the high points tonight. The June 4th County Commission meeting will be an opportunity to continue the dialogue with a back and forth. Remember tonight that we will not be having questions from the audience, no responses from the county commission. This is about filling the room with your ideas. It's a public input process. Now, I'll guide public comment with a real simple process. It treats everyone fairly, make sure everybody is treated the same. Um, here's how it'll work. We'll have Jeff seated over here. He will call speakers up, so there will always be a speaker in the queue. Um, 
uh, speakers, when you are, you will have 10 minutes to speak, and Mehdi here, when you have two minutes left, will show you a two minutes left card. Please wrap up. And then Mehdi, when you get to your timeout, will flip the card, and you'll see red, and it says, timeout, please take your seat. So that's the process of public comment. Now, here's a tricky part. These 10 minutes are your 10 minutes alone. You can't share them with anyone. You can't give your 10 minutes to somebody else. They're your 10 minutes. So that's the way that works. And remember, speakers, that this summit is being recorded on video, and the video will be posted on the county's website. So that's the process of public comment. This is the only time I'll ask for questions about the process of public comment. Any questions? Yes. The intention is that your voice would be heard once. That was the intention. Okay, guidelines for public comment. I love this part. This is where I play my role of assuring that everybody feels safe and is treated fairly. Um, we have two guidelines for speakers and two guidelines for the audience. So speakers, your two guidelines. The first one is finish in time. Really easy. Be gracious. When your time's up, sit down. Be gracious so that you don't take somebody else's time. That's simple. Speakers, your other guideline is a little different, and that is to use your time wisely. Use your 10 minutes wisely. The county commissioners are all seated here, and they are intently listening to you. This is valuable time. You have their full undivided attention. What they want to know is what you need regarding transportation, what you need. So during your time, tell them what you need. But that said, it's your time. If at your time at the mic, you want to spend part or all of it complaining or criticizing or telling the county commission exactly what I will not do, you can do that with no personal attacks. But if you choose to complain and criticize and tell them what you won't do, then you've missed an opportunity to tell the commissioners what you need and what you will do. It's really valuable time, so use your time wisely. That's the other guideline for speakers. Okay, the guidelines for the audience. The first one is one speaker at a time, and what that means is that whoever's at the microphone is the speaker. So please, no interruptions from side conversations out in the audience while the speaker's at the mic. The second guideline for the audience is no bullying the speaker. And I know you all are thinking, well, we're not bullies. We don't bully. We don't bully. And actually, I know that there are no bullies in this room. But sometimes we act like bullies, and we don't even realize we are. Because bullying comes in all different grades. And certainly, we know that bullying is heckling. So if we're not going to bully the spirit, but we're not going to heckle, and we're not going to jeer, but you're also not going to snort and harumph. Those are heckling. But most importantly, and this is what I'm getting at, no laughing at the speaker. Imagine that you're one of those people who is terrified of speaking in public, but you have come tonight and you have gotten up the nerve to sign a speaker card and you are standing up there and you are expressing your opinions and maybe they're not popular opinions, and someone in the back of the room laughs at you. So this is a safe place for people to speak and express their views. So no bullying the speaker. So. All right, I am done. We're going to start the public input with a short presentation from Alachua County staff. I thought this was a good idea to begin by helping, allowing Alachua County staff to provide an overview of their transportation efforts. So I'm going to introduce Jeff Hayes, and Jeff is the Transportation Planning Manager for the Alachua County Growth Management Department, and also Dave Serlanik, who is the Alachua County Assistant Director of Public Works. Well, thank you, Carol. Um, as Carol mentioned, we're going to do a, a brief overview of the county's existing transportation plan. As Carol and Mr. Drummond noted, this is 
a new beginning, but obviously the county and all of the jurisdictions um, in Alachua County have been doing transportation planning for many years and have transportation issues and, and things that are have been discussed for many years. And I wanted to give a brief update on what the county's transportation plan is, how it relates to land use uh, and transportation, and then Dave is going to talk a little bit about some of the county's unmet needs when it comes to the maintenance of our existing transportation system. Um, well, as you're aware, obviously we're in Alachua County. Here you see uh, the county boundary. What I, my job primarily is to deal with the unincorporated area when it comes to transportation because in growth management we deal with meeting the needs of new capacity and alleviating congestion and providing transit service in the unincorporated area uh, outside of the city of Gainesville, outside of the city of Alachua, outside of our other municipalities and providing that new capacity for the portion of the county that's, that's still growing. Um, and as you see outlined in this mostly yellow color is what we call our urban cluster boundary. And that's where we have, in our comprehensive plan, ad adopted land uses that provide for urban and suburban type development. And those types of developments call for certain types of transportation systems to support uh, the residents who are living there. About three, four years ago, uh, the county embarked on a transportation planning effort uh, and land use planning effort it was a big rewrite of our comprehensive plan. Our comprehensive plan is the adopted document for Alachua County which states how land will be developed and how the transportation system in Alachua County uh, will be developed over time. Uh, we call that effort the Alachua County Mobility Plan. It had three primary elements. Um, it had a land use plan. It was a major rewrite to the land use plan for Alachua County. It had to deal primarily with transit-oriented development, traditional neighborhood development, and allowing those types of developments uh, to go through a streamlined process and to avoid some of the pitfalls that we had previously in our land use plan and code uh, that involved quite lengthy approval processes and review times for developments that everyone uh, through the planning process said that were, the, were uh, attractive type of developments. The second part, of course, was the transportation plan. Uh, it's a multimodal plan. That means all modes of transportation. Um, it has roadway connections that are part of that plan. It has express and premium transit service. It has a bicycle and pedestrian network in building that out. And then lastly, there's the funding component. And so these are things that we established in the comprehensive plan and it followed up with uh, in the code and the other ordinances. And that's our multimodal transportation mitigation and tax increment financing districts, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. But as I mentioned, the land use component um, was an important component for the plan. We had had a lot of private sector interest in doing these more mixed-use developments, and previously in the county we had a very onerous process uh, with lots of steps, uh, lots of time involved, lots of reviews up at the state level and back down again if you wanted to do a mixed-use project. Um, the land use changes primarily, and these are the types of developments that are walkable, uh, mixed-use developments. Um, we allowed those developments by right in a lot of our land use districts um, without having to go through that, those more lengthy review process. Um, and the big idea is, is that if these are the types of developments that the, the market was asking about and that the community through our public input process thought were attractive, these are the ones that we wanted to allow smoothly. Obviously that flows into the um, transportation plan because in order to have those types of uh, land uses uh, we need a transportation network that complements that land use plan. Um, it is a multimodal transportation plan. It does have a lot of uh, roadway improvements and as I mentioned my job in growth management is to deal primarily with new capacity and dealing with transportation needs in terms of facilities or transit service that hasn't yet been built. Um, Dave's going to talk a little bit more here in a second about the transportation infrastructure that has been built and our need to maintain that. But my primary responsibility is for looking for uh, how to support a growing community. Um, it does include an interconnected roadway network, some limited widening of roads, and I'll show just this is the roadway map. This is our adopted transportation plan when it comes to infrastructure in Alachua County. Obviously, uh, we coordinate well and, and very much so with the city of Gainesville and our other the surrounding municipalities and with the Metropolitan Transportation Planning Organization that's the city and the county sitting together on a board uh, determining how transportation uh, dollars from the federal government will be spent. Um, but in terms of our local transportation network, just some roadways that you'll recognize is continuing the four-laning of 23rd Avenue, um, eventually out over the interstate, at least in the short term out to 83rd Street, eventually building a two-lane road out to the Jonesville Park area, continuing 8th Avenue, Southwest 8th Avenue, uh, through the town of Tioga area and out to 143rd Street. Some additional parallel roadway connection to some of our major uh, roads, and that's a big uh, component of the roadway plan, is to provide parallel road capacity 
So when you're stuck in traffic on Newberry Road, there's not a lot we can do in terms of widening Newberry Road to 6, 8, 10, 12 lanes. Eventually we need to have parallel capacity to Newberry Road, so if you want to go east-west across Electoral County, you'll be able to get there through multiple avenues. And that's the kind of system, if you're familiar with the heart of the city of Gainesville, that's the kind of system that was developed um, when the city of Gainesville, the original core of Gainesville was developed, was a gridded roadway network. Um, of course, we had a bicycle and pedestrian plan that was a component of the mobility plan, and primarily it was to add uh, in-street bike lanes wherever we could when we were resurfacing a road, uh, at least a swale section road, a road that doesn't have curb and gutter where the curbs aren't set. Additionally, it was wherever we didn't have a multi-use path or a sidewalk, here's an example, 98th Street, something that's going to be constructed here in the near future, where there's no, it's a collector roadway, it, it, it carries traffic, uh, you know, it's not just local traffic, but also uh, traffic coming in from other um, areas. Uh, we wanted to provide bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure on those types of roads, so we ha called for multi-use paths al along at least one side of each road that's either a collector road or an arterial road, and that's uh, planner lingo for uh, large roadways. In terms of the transit uh, aspects of the mobility plan, we uh, had a two-phase plan. One was that we needed to have, we currently have some uh, transit service in the unincorporated area that provides local circulator service into East Gainesville, uh, the Tower Road area with Route 75 and some uh, service up to the Santa Fe College area. Uh, front, and all of that runs into the city of Gainesville and into the heart of uh, the University of Florida. Well, we wanted to eventually start to provide some service out to the edges of our urban cluster area to start applying the pump um, for transit service eventually to serve those areas out to Jonesville, uh, more frequent service out to the Santa Fe College area, out to the East Side Activity Center and East Side High School. Um, to provide some peak hour transit service to, to help to provide some commuter service into the city of Gainesville and into the University of Florida. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how that service would eventually evolve into a more um, premium type of transit service. And the real rationale behind doing a multimodal plan and invo involving uh, even premium transit service in par portions of the county where we don't, don't currently have any transit service um, is to do it in, ver in a very discreet way, is not to run transit all over uh, throughout all of our local roads uh, in West Gainesville or East Gainesville, but to provide transit on very discreet corridors where we knew we had right of way where we could do some premium transit service um, and they could start to serve the land uses that we knew were coming in. I work in the growth management department, so all the calls about new development uh, come to our office and requests about new development and how we could serve areas we knew were going to develop um, with the transit network was, was a primary part of the plan. Uh, this is an example of a premium type transit service. Some two you'll call it bus rapid transit. This is in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, this is a, a facility that's already constructed. They're actually working on their third um, route in Eugene. They've got two that are, are running now. Um, this is a road. Uh, Eugene's a town not unlike Gainesville in any way. It's the home of the University of Oregon. Uh, this is a roadway that's not unlike a new barrier and archer road. Uh, they did have some available right of way in the median where they could provide transit in a dedicated lane. Uh, the transit pulls up to a station. Uh, people get on and out, off without paying their fares. Uh, you know, they're not fumbling for change. It's very quick. It's convenient. Um, it's very visible in the community. It's branded um, and it's, it's highly visible. This is actually their first route as you see in this um, diagram here that ran between a little hub in downtown Eugene and a hub in the little town of Springfield about four miles away. And portions of that, they had dedicated lanes that you see here, and other portions where they didn't have the available right of way, they didn't have dedicated lanes. Um, it's a very flexible type of system, and where there's the availability of right of way, it provides for a very quick and attractive system. And the statistic I like to use about why I do this system instead of just running buses um, into uh, the unincorporated area is that they had an existing bus route running this exact route between Eugene and Springfield, and the first year they opened this system, they doubled their ridership. It was a 100% increase. And if you ever get on the vehicles, you'll understand it's a much nicer thing. It's the difference between getting on a subway or a light rail line and getting on um, an RTS bus. I love RTS buses, but there's certainly a bias sometimes against that, that kind of transportation mode. Well, a couple of things real quickly is that um, our multimodal transportation mitigation, I talked about our funding. These are funding sources that we adopted in the county. These are, under, these are part of our adopted code and a part of our adopted ordinances. These are not things that are needs any longer in terms of, um, and I think Dave's gonna talk a little bit more about some unfunded needs. Um, our multimodal transportation mitigation, I think the take home message, it's a one-time fee on new development. And the rationale behind it is just like an impact fee. It's, it's very similar to our existing transportation impact fee. In fact, it replaces it for the folks who pay this fee or pay this mitigation amount. Um, it's a simple lookup table. 
It's, it's, it did provide for incentives for compact and mixed-use developments, um, and that's primarily due to they have a reduced impact on the transportation uh, system. And those, um, you know, there's more internal trips and those type of developments. In terms of our transportation improvement districts, that's with the tax increment financing. This is, uh, I don't want to go too much into detail here because I want to move along and let everyone else um, get more detail. But this is something we, the county commission adopted around, uh, we've adopted one of these already around uh, the Celebration Point development. Uh, and it's for the increase in tax revenue that happens with those developments. Um, and the rationale behind that, this is a chart that shows, this is from Sarasota County, but we have similar data from Alachua County as well that shows the undeveloped uh, property, uh, the tax revenue per acre, you see it kind of creeping up here, multifamily. Uh, so then you start to get into some uh, retail developments, Walmarts, into some mall developments, and you see that it does increase somewhat, but the tax revenue or the ad valorem revenue per acre really jumps up when you start to see these multi-story and mixed-use development types and that's because it's a very efficient use of the land. The land uses are very close together. In fact, they're stacked right on top of each other and oftentimes. Well, I wanted to leave with where we are in this plan. This is a plan that was adopted in 2010. Uh, it's been ongoing here since uh, that time. And we've already approved one development. That's a celebration point. And I'll go, that's the land use plan um, for celebration point. This is a comparison and this another rationale for why this is, makes good financial and fiscal sits for the county. Um, Dave's going to talk about road maintenance here in a second, and these are comparisons of two of our developments in Alachua County. Uh, one, you know, started Hale Plantation. It's a very nice uh, neighborhood. Started development in the late 70s through the 80s and 90s. Um, there's 37 miles of paved road in Hale Plantation to su support the 2,600 dwelling units. Well, in Celebration Point, there's a plan uh, to be three miles of paved road to support uh, the dwelling. It's much more dense and intense development type. Um, but has less, much less um, responsibility from the public sector to maintain that infrastructure over time. And I just wanted to leave uh, with where we're at with the mobility plan and the comprehensive plan. The celebration point developments here at number 19, it has been approved. There's a developer's agreement in place with Alachua County. Uh, these projects, this is a Newberry Village project where you see the number four, and you see the number eight is a project called Santa Fe Village, and we see number nine and 10 is a project called Spring Hills. Um, these are all coming in as these transit-oriented develop developments, these more dense uh, mixed-use type developments. Um, and they're going to be constructing a fair bit of this infrastructure uh, that's called for as part of the transit system as well as the roadway network and bicycle and pedestrian network. Obviously, we're coordinating well with the City of Gainesville. I know the City of Gainesville's uh, staff is going to speak this evening. Uh, the City of Gainesville is undergoing an alternatives analysis for a similar type transit system, and they also have roadway plans that they'll go to in more detail. But in terms of our transit network, how the county is looking to uh, coordinate with the city of Gainesville is to make sure any system that's built in the unincorporated area matches up very well with the system that's built inside the city of Gainesville. And this line is the, from the city of Gainesville's uh, bus rapid transit feasibility analysis, and the city's undergoing a much more intensive type analysis to refine that and to refine the types of transportation modes that would be used in that corridor. Um, so that completes my portion of the presentation, and now Dave's gonna talk a little bit more about our, our roadway maintenance. All right, so Jeff told you a lot about what we have. Well, what's left? What's critical for us and what's really unfunded? And it really is down to our existing infrastructure. And it really isn't anything new. We've been talking about this for a few years now. And every year, you can see it's getting a little bit worse. Well, I wanted to kind of go over what the Alachua County's portion of it is, because a lot of the cities have similar issues, and they'll be able to speak on their own behalf. But Clearly, we have a county-wide system that, as you can see by all these uh, black lines, these are our county roads. And as you can also see that many of the roads go in and through each of the cities. So we are a community-wide issue. Existing infrastructure isn't really, you know, it's all around us, and we all use it. So what does it look like? Well, when we did our analysis in 2010, we did a real full investigation of our entire infrastructure. And when we looked at that, we have 677 miles of paved roads on the county infrastructure. And of that 677 miles, 85% of that infrastructure is in need of some type of structural repair. And uh, what we have here is we've got a pie chart showing the different types of repair. I'll get into that in a minute. 
When you sum that up and you start looking at those repair strategies and the costs of doing those repair strategies, uh, we have a little hash mark here that shows our current time uh, right, right about there. And we're sitting right around $380 million for the county's road system in terms of pavement management need. So again, it's a very large sum of money for our community. I wanted to talk a little bit about pavement because it's not one of those things that you can fix and forget. It's something that will continuously deteriorate over time. So you start with a new road like this, and in 20 years' time, you start to see things. You start to see cracking and rutting and a little bit of delaminations of your asphalt because asphalt usually only lasts about 20 years before you need to do something about it. As you get to the 30-year mark, you start to see potholes that we have to go out and dump a little bit of asphalt in and go. And then finally, by the 40-year mark, you've lost your entire infrastructure and you have to start over. I want to go back to the 20-year point and the 30-year point. When we did our analysis, the county road system's average age was 25 years. So we've already gone past the useful life of asphalt and we're somewhere between this picture and that picture for our infrastructure on average. And if we don't get a new funding source to help address some of these issues, our average age will look a little bit like this. Obviously, some of the roads will be younger, some of the roads will be older, but on an average, a county road will look a lot like this in certain spots. So again, 40 years old for average. So where do we want to be? We want to be effective. We want to be able to use taxpayer dollars to the best of our abilities. And that is to catch the problems early and often maintain on a routine and regular basis. That minimizes your cost. And again, as I mentioned before, road deterioration continues, which means we want a funding source that's also perpetual to continue to address the issue. This note down here, never let a road reach the need for structural repair. We say this for a reason, and it's because it's extremely expensive when you look at a roadway, it's not just asphalt on top. It's about two, three, maybe even more feet of material when you drive on a road. You start with stabilized material, and you have to get that compacted. And then you get some lime rock base course. And you start putting your asphalt lifts on there. And again, uh, a layer is also called a course. So for anybody that's more legally or jumbo, oh, anyway. Uh, we got about an inch and a half of, of a friction course, another inch and a half of asphalt structural course. And what you want to do in terms of effective pavement management is you want to catch the need while it's still early in your friction course. You want to be able to take care of milling off this piece and putting it back because that's your most effective, cost effectively. That's your best way of dealing with your pavement management needs. Now, when you start getting into the structural course, that's more material, more time, more expensive. And then when, when you finally lose your asphalt and you start getting into your base courses, that's when the costs skyrocket. Well, for example, we go back to the pie chart I started with. And I want to point you to these two slices of our pie as of the 2010 analysis. That showed we had only around 9% of our infrastructure in those two categories but it took 15% of the need in terms of 56 million of the 380 million I mentioned. Well, if we continue on in the year 2030, that pie slice, those two pie slices will become around a quarter of our total and it will quadruple in price. So again, try not to let roads get to this point because it really is cost effective to deal with them in these other categories where you're only doing minor milling and resurfacing and moving on. So Jeff told you what we have. We have plans in place to deal with new roadway capacity as they are needed, new bike ped facilities, new transit, and we have ways of linking everything together with our community. The one thing that we feel in terms of the county is still missing in our total plan is our pavement management program. So again, that is our need. And we hope to hear from all of you what your needs are. So thank you.
All right, I think it's time for our first um, speaker who is um, Abate. Good evening. My name is Bruce Nelson. I'm with an organization that we call ABATE. It's American Bikers Aimed Toward Education. We are a, not a gang. We're not a club. We're not a Harley group. We are a motorcycle rights organization and a motorcycle safety organization. We are the only motorcycle safety organization in the state that has the resources and the trained instructors to carry out motorcycle safety programs throughout the state and receive funding from the state of Florida as rebates off the tag of motorcycles. By the way, there are over one million registered motorcycles in the state of Florida. My interest tonight and the interest of the members of ABATE is to shed light on the condition of the roadways at Alachua County. They're in an embarrassing, unsafe, terrible condition and they are damaging to equipment are going to result in deaths and they are extremely damaging to motorcycle and small vehicle operators. Imagine hitting some of the road conditions that you see throughout this county on a dark night in a rainstorm, especially if you're in unfamiliar territory and you come from another part of the state and you expect that Alachua County as just as progressive as counties like Duval instead of regressive in letting their pavement management reach the deteriorated state that it's currently in. Uh, the problem with that is now it's been neglected for 30 years. It's gotten to the point where the cost figures are so high that only a dedicated source of revenue which could be bonded, and by the way, unless something has changed, I don't believe Alachua County can get a bond without a dedicated source of revenue to pay for that bond. And if we're not there, we're real close. So the roads, there's two choices. You're gonna pay for repair of the roads via a consumption tax, i.e. sales tax. Or you're gonna pay for the roads on the back of ad valorem and business taxpayers. But make no mistake, there will be a point when you'll have two choices, fix the roads or increase the fleet of motor graders to motor grade our roads, which used to be asphalt. It's that critical, you can see it throughout the county. So now, do you wanna say that, oh, we're only gonna take care of with this available transportation surtax, roads only? I'm not of that camp. There are people in the community. I do feel that we need to address the roads first. For years, we've been told the roads can wait. There's been agenda politics that have driven tax funds into other areas rather than repair and resurfacing of our roads, leaving them in their condition that they're in. So what we have to do and think about now is how are we going to fund? Where is the money going to come from? There are limited funds. The last transportation surtax initiative, which failed, okay, would have generated a total over 15 years at three quarter cent, less than $190 million for the county's share to retire a road pavement deficit of $400 million. And if county staff's projections were correct last time, because of the activities of certain groups against that initiative, our bill has now gone up $65 million per year. So add another $130 million if we get a source of funding that the taxpayers will accept in this next election. So I think it would be short-sighted to say that all we want for transportation is to take these funds from a surtax and direct them all toward pavement management because of the past indiscretions of our elected officials in taking care of the problem. And I don't want to go into blame on individuals, but it's a fact that's right there before your eyes, the condition of our infrastructure. 
our road infrastructure and the safety of our citizens and the ability to carry out commerce in a safe manner, it will come to your attention how bad it is when a small vehicle in a driving rain, haven't you driven around the county and see vehicles riding the crown of the roads? They're trying to stay out of the ruts and the potholes that are in many of our roads. Eventually, there's going to be some very serious collisions. So it's going to be addressed one way or the other. Now, how do you get a consensus among people to, uh, to, so that we all feel safe? By the way, I feel very safe here tonight. Thank you very much. Okay. I, don't, I don't feel the least bit threatened. Okay. And I haven't attended such a lecture since Sue Baird was sworn in. But anyway, so, so I, I want to thank you. It's been real dynamic so far. But uh, so what we have to do then is start to get a community consensus to how we can reach a level, okay, uh, the, where the majority of the taxpayers, both in the rural areas, small communities, and the city of Gaines will see something in these tax initiatives that they can actually support and vote for and be flexible enough to where we can take care. Because, by the way, if you don't do something about the roads, the bill is just going to continue to go up. Otherwise, you're going to be in the only graded road county in the state. So take your pick. So we have to look at other needs that people have in this community. And I uh, have met on record, and I have created some enemies by stating that I don't believe bus transit is an unnecessary. It's very necessary for a city of size in Gainesville. But how we carry out that bus transit, how efficient it is, how it's structured, how we're going to fund it, and to what degree we're going to fund bus tra transit is something that the taxpayers are going to have to take a good, strong, hard look at and make some hard decisions. I would recommend that we start looking at such things as express buses that will emerge to our high traffic employment areas, such as Shands, the VA, okay, the Oaks Mall, Hale Plantation. These collection areas could occur, occur in areas around Tower Road on the east side of Gainesville even on the outlying parts of the city, such as right across the road at Walmart, where there's a park and ride. And collector points can bring people to them and then bus dedicated on our standard roadways can go as express buses to these locations during peak times. I would support funding for such a thing. What I will not support, and I don't think the public will, and the reason I bring this up is I've been very attuned to this issue for 10 years. At this point in time, looking at the backlog in roads and the inadequate headways of buses and the lack of any express bus service, these things need to be funded before we start building an entire new transit system with dedicated right-of-ways and roadways. I love some of the terms I hear when I go to county commission meetings. One of my favorite is calming traffic. We want to calm traffic. Okay, that means they want you to sit in congestion. Okay, now if we want to calm traffic so much, why are we talking about bus rapid transit? Get up a little earlier, drink your coffee on an express bus. The multimodal mitigation and the transit oriented communities can get bus service. Okay, but they can get on a express bus and run on the same roads as everybody else does. And then maybe there will be a different attitude about traffic calming. One of the other things that really gets me that happened at county commission meetings is we want our bike paths to be super slick and smooth. And we want to make sure there's no little bumps or unevenness because it throws bike tires off. I say, why do we want to deny bike riders as much fun as I have dodging potholes, ruts, floods, and everything else on the roads. So if you're going to be candid about it, okay, stop this nonsense about that, you know, everything has to be perfect and, I, and, and the transit, anybody that's for repairing the roads automatically hates buses. I don't think that's the case. I think the taxpayers want to see the most efficient system we can get. There's only so much money to go around, so the question is where is it going to come from? Where is it going to serve the most people? Where is it going to be the most effective towards safety and mobility of the people within our community? And them are the questions we need to answer. Uh, and I guess in closing, I would state 
that I think that we could come up with a tax that will pass. It is going to be difficult. I think there's agenda-driven politics that's demanding bus rapid transit for a few thousand people, leaving another 250,000 sitting out there in the lurches. And if that occurs, the taxpayers will spot it for what it is. The term of the tax should not exceed four years. It should be subject to citizen review on a twice-a-year basis to see that the money is being spent. It needs to be inclusive of a very clear, concise project list. It should be very difficult to deviate from that project list by requiring the supermajorities that were in the last tax. There's much more that could be said, but I hope you'll think about it. Where is the money going to come from, and who wants their loved one to die first? Thank you. I believe the Builders Association of North Central Florida is going to speak. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening. My name is Kara Bolton, and I am the president of the Builders Association of North Central Florida. Our membership is comprised of 550 members throughout Gainesville, Alachua County, and beyond. It is my pleasure to provide our organization's input for your thoughtful consideration. I'm going to cut right to the chase. The Builders Association supports a five-year tax for transportation improvements with a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in impact fees and MMTM fees as provided for by those programs. The Builders Association contends that the Citizens Initiative should consist of a blend of projects, specifically safe, tree-lined urban streets and sidewalks, pavement management, including roads and rural areas, and transit. As part of any countywide initiative, pavement management must be a top priority. Alachua County's roads have been neglected and underfunded and are in desperate need of repair on existing roads. Construction of new roads are needed to relieve congestion and improve traffic flow. The Builders Association suggests that this is best accomplished by establishing a specific list of, prior, of prioritized pavement improvement projects. That list is currently being developed and vetted by our colleagues at the Chamber of Commerce and will become part of the conversation on this issue in the very near future. A balanced list should include maintenance to rural roadways necessary for agriculture, bike lanes and sidewalks in urbanized areas with a live oak tree canopy in areas where they make sense, and improvements to existing roadways and intersections. It should be noted that we have advocated for many years to plant live oak trees alongside streets and sidewalks and within six foot planting strips in parking lots and medians, and still believe it to be a sensible approach. In addition to pavement management and vehicular road construction, there should be a component of public transit. In 2011, the Builders Association supported the Multimodal Transportation Mitigation Program, which allowed development to continue. The County Commission adopted a fee schedule that incentivized developers to design and build transit-oriented communities to feature dedicated bus lanes, air-conditioned bus stations, and park and ride lots. While many of the builders do not like buses, we do like the bus turnouts. Bus transit has a place in this community. However, we believe that large-scale implementation of a bus rapid transit system on existing roadways is premature. Instead, we believe that our community should focus on delivering enhanced bus services, such as bus turnouts, decreased headways, and signal prioritization along the system's best performing routes in terms of ridership, as well as expansion of service to those non-student riders that are in the greatest need. Furthermore, smaller buses should service less intense routes. These initial enhancements and other modifications will provide us good information to evaluate the effectiveness of the changes. The enhancements can then uh, expand to other routes. With each success or failure, we can measure important considerations such as ridership,
cost versus benefit, and congestion, as well as to the impact to businesses such as those bypassed along those corridors and adjust future expansions to the transportation network accordingly. In summary, the Builders Association supports a community-driven five-year tax with an emphasis on quality street trees, pavement management, vehicular road construction, and enhancement of the existing RTS system on routes with proven success with an equal offset of impact and MMTM fees. The county commissioners should consider a further reduction on impact and development fees to stimulate the local economy, add improved properties to the tax rolls, and help shape a community that can sustain public transit. And uh, as our moderator mentioned, transportation is, expenses, is expensive, so I'm going to repeat that. The county commissioners should consider a further reduction or moratorium on impact and development fees to stimulate the local economy, add improved properties to the tax rolls, and help shape a community that can sustain public transit. We need to move quickly on a decision and get unstuck. The Builders Association looks forward to building a consensus with the various community groups to implement a logical, cost-effective, and comprehensive transportation system that will meet the needs and expectations of the citizens of Alachua County and the City of Gainesville for many years to come. Thank you so much. behalf of the city of Gainesville appreciate this opportunity to be able to express what our transportation needs are in the city um, the city has taken an approach of looking at a balanced transportation system we have a number of policies outlined in our comprehensive plan that encourage the creation of a balanced transportation system to meet the needs of all of the users uh, that uh, travel around the city of Gainesville there are some specific strategic initiatives that the city commission has adopted that look at invest in community infrastructure and continue to enhance the transportation network and the systems. They we focus on preserving the existing infrastructure and by the existing infrastructure we're talking about not just the pavement but also the sidewalks, the traffic signals and the pavement markings and all of the infrastructure that goes into place in order to um, help people move around. And we also look at trying to enhance the transportation choices that are available to the residents and the visitors and the people that get around the city of Gainesville. I mean, looking at the balanced transportation system, we look at a safe, reliable, and convenient multimodal transportation system, and we believe that equals um, having travel options and reduced congestion. There are several things about the city of Gainesville that make it somewhat unique than from some of the other areas of um, Alachua County. Within the city of Gainesville uh, city limits, there are few opportunities for us to add travel lanes to deal with congestion. Either roadways or policy constraints, such as the Northwest 34th Street corridor, where the MTPO constrained that from a policy standpoint back in the 80s. There are some physically constrained corridors such as University Avenue, 13th Street, Newberry Road where the costs are prohibitive to be able to widen those roadways. So we're looking at options for being able to deal with the mobility needs in the community. There are some limited opportunities to provide additional transportation corridors and provide additional connectivity. And some examples of that would be um, Southwest 40th uh, Boulevard, Southwest 62nd Street, and um, our plans call for those types of corridors to be constructed. We also look at enhancing the existing system to the maximum extent possible. The community has invested um, $18 million into our traffic management system, and that helps us to be able to get the most out of the existing system that we can and also looking at optional modes. We put a lot of the emphasis on um, completing our sidewalk, sidewalk network in areas of the community where there is a lot of walking 
um, looking at expanding our bicycle and pedestrian networks, as well as our transit system, enhancing the um, options there available to the community. The City of Gainesville goes through prioritization process for all of our projects. We look at the transportation mobility element, the capital improvement element, um, for the long-range planning needs uh, associated with the uh, city's transportation system. And then we come in every um, couple of years and look at our capital improvement program, and we have both the funded and unfunded sections of that. We also participate in the Metropolitan Transportation Planning Organization where we look at long-range transportation plans and um, the short-range plans through the TIP process. But for the city projects, what we do is develop a prioritization criteria in which we look at um, several considerations. One, existing conditions, pavement condition, uh, traffic volumes associated with the roadway, um, the roadways classification. We look at safety issues, crashes, um, proximity to schools and transit and, and opportunity for that connectivity between the modes of travel as well as connectivity to regional areas um, and making sure we're consistent with other plans. We look at redevelopment incentives and opportunity to partner with other um, um, groups, enhancing access to disadvantaged groups and access to activity centers. Some of our current funding that we have available um, is somewhat diverse um, and uh, some of it's some one-time funds, but we do have the additional local option gas tax, which for the city of Gainesville, it's about $1.2 million a year. $440,000 of that each year goes to the transit system and the balance goes to roads. That particular gas tax is intended to be used to increase um, capacity of the system um, and that is defined as also resurfacing or reconstruction of major roadways. The campus development agreement, we had $20 million of one-time money that was intended to be for a very specific list of projects. In our solid waste fund, we actually have a transfer to a residential resurfacing program. It's $300,000 a year. That is based on a 1992 formula, which we're currently evaluating. And then we also, the city commission has identified beginning in fiscal year 15 an additional $490,000 a year that they're going to be allocating to our residential resurfacing program as well as a bond in the 2015 year for an additional one-time $4.5 million. We work very hard to try to match money. Uh, we have a significant number of federal and um, state grants that we have had the opportunity to um, obtain. Um, and so the traffic management system I mentioned, there was an effort locally to raise $9 million in order to match that dollar for dollar with state funds. And so that provided the $18 million. Our transit system is very effective at providing um, grant opportunities for their needs and uh, the federal uh, federal resources have contributed to the RTS maintenance administration campus that is currently under construction. And then our Depot Avenue is another example of um, where we've been able to match uh, more than just dollar for dollar. We've actually gotten um, additional funds for that project. Some miscellaneous areas of funding we have uh, are our tra transportation concurrency exception area. Uh, goes to fund um, things like uh, signal modifications, um, the intersection improvements, uh, some of the corridor, um, increasing the sidewalks and that sort of thing. The CDBG funds, the Community Development Block Grant funds, are for specific defined areas based on economic conditions, and we use that to reconstruct existing infrastructure to um, solve some infrastructure issues such as drainage or stormwater management needs, as well as to increase the sidewalk and pedestrian networks in those communities. And then our community redevelopment agency also provides a number of enhanced projects for streetscaping and um, incentives for some of the infrastructure that is intended to help incentivize, incentivize private investment back into the um, communities. We also have um, in our current uh, CIP 
uh, about $100,000 a year for a sidewalk expansion of our sidewalk network, as well as some one-time uh, funds to increase the connectivity between neighborhoods. So right now we have about $60 million of funded projects that we're working on. Um, just so you know that we do have a lot of things underway. Uh, this is a map that shows you they're spread out all over this community. It's not just isolated in one area. We do have a lot of unfunded needs as well. Um, David talked a lot about the uh, pavement management. We also have that issue, the need for resurfacing. Um, this $23.5 million here is an estimate uh, that we have to be able to, the unfunded portion to raise the overall pavement condition with city streets to a 70 uh, condition. And these are just a map showing some of the uh, unfunded roadway needs around the city. Untr unfunded transit um, services, we have uh, every year do a transportation uh, development plan and we also a couple years ago developed a premium transit plan and in there we identify a number of needs for enhancing existing fixed route services as well as providing a flexible um, services that would be considered premium the bus rapid transit and the urban circulator this is just a map showing some of those projects that uh, have been identified and talked about at the city level. Overall, our unfunded needs um, are here uh, identified, and um, I can tell you from my perspective at having worked with the city for a number of years now that um, each of these components is extremely important in, in order for us to promote the livability and the um, effectiveness of the com community. And uh, we are um, looking for ways to maximize our opportunity for our funded projects and looking for additional funds to complete our system. Thank you very much. And we have James uh, Thompson of the Gainesville Cycling Club. Good evening, uh, commissioners, elected officials, and uh, members of the public. Um, I'm James Thompson. I uh, am the advocacy director for the Gainesville Cycling Club. We are 1,100 strong, um, one of the largest clubs of any kind in the, uh, the, uh, the county here. Most of our folks are Alachua County residents. Um, interesting uh, things tonight. I do want to say in, in regards to what our facilitator uh, said at the beginning, um, I, I do hope this is a new beginning. Um, and I already see that when I hear the people speaking before me. I think I've agree with a lot of things that everybody has already said up here. I, of course, disagree with some things too, but I hear things from um, Abate, uh, from the uh, Builders Association, obviously the, the city, and um, I agree with a lot of that stuff. So I think we can work together on a lot of these things. Um, we've already proven um, in this last election cycle that we can you know, vote against uh, spending on transportation and roads. Um, I think the question is how do we move forward and convince my uh, folks and other folks that we can vote yes on it and, and spend some things on some things we need to get done. Um, I think we've accomplished a lot in this community. Uh, we have a silver star in Gainesville from the League of American Cyclists for bikeability that we earned over the last few decades. Um, we do have some excellent bike ped facilities. Um, our bus ridership is over the top. I came here in the mid 90s when um, out on the southwest part of Archer Road, you'd had to wait, wait for a bus for about 45 minutes to an hour to go into campus. Now, I think probably in the time it takes you to walk from your apartment to the bus stop, you can miss a couple of buses. Um, that, that's awesome. We are now, according to the last census, uh, number seven in the nation in front of Portland, Oregon, which I, I think that's bragging rights, 
for the percentage of our population in the Gainesville metro area, which is actually a good portion of, um, of Alachua County, for the percentage of people that actually ride their bikes to school and work and play. Um, that number is about 6 to 7 percent, depending on how you, how you count. Um, that's pretty awesome. That's great stuff. Um, we do, however, have some, some issues that need to be addressed. And I think the pavement issue is often seen as an automobile issue only. But I want to assure all of you, and especially Mr. Nelson and the abate crowd, that we cyclists do ride in the worst part of the street. <laughs> it's, it's the edge of the road. And I feel you. I do. It's, it's bad. Um, I was very lucky this morning to ride on some fairly decent roads that are less traveled uh, by Rocky Point Road, uh, Payne's Prairie. Um, I got to watch the fog lift back on uh, Wakahoota Road, which is a little bumpy, but no one's really out there anyway. And uh, we have a beautiful county. And there's a lot of beautiful places to go, the, the bike uh, trails, the rails to trails, the facilities in High Springs, Archer, Latchaway, uh, Gainesville. These are things that attract tourists from all over the country, and they're things that make those communities livable and uh, more enjoyable to be in. So we do have a lot of awesome things. What could we do? What would I like to see done? What would my group like to see done, I think? Um, some easy things uh, that I'll mention first are there is a vast network of easements, fire roads, trails, cut-throughs, alleyways, much of it owned by GRU, which is the city, some of it owned by the county, and a lot of these places are actually very safe and are actually being used to transit by foot and bike um, as we speak. Uh, most of them are not trespass roads or trails. They're, they're open. They're not posted. Um, you know, I think we need to sort of look at that as some other cities have across the country and see if there aren't some of those places that with very little investment, very little patrolling, very little inputs as far as money goes, can actually be used to get bikes and foot walkers off of the streets and onto places that are pretty and enjoyable and in many cases cut straight lines and bee lines through to the places they need to go. That's good for everybody. I mean, I ride on the street, but I'd love to be able to um, allow uh, young people especially and kids to ride on places where they don't have to be next to cars. That, that would be preferable. Um, that network is, is mapped. It's out there. There are even people adding uh, the new, I call them the new white lines to their Google Maps. Um, you can see some of them if you look up uh, um, some of our cities in the county. So I think that's something we need to look at. Um, another thing I think we need to do is um, realize that I think we talk past each other a lot, and it's nice to get here together and speak to the commission and to the public about these things. But I think it's clear to me that some of us stakeholder type folks need to actually get together somewhere else and hang out and talk. Um, we're the little guy in the ocean here. I mean, there's not, the, the cyclists are a small portion of the road users, but uh, so it's very easy for us to do that. But I'd love to meet some of y'all sometime out and you know, go grab a burger or whatever at some place and have a talk about this stuff. Because I think when we come to county meetings and city meetings and argue and poke and uh, sort of fight with each other about this stuff, we don't get a lot of done and the roads tax fails, um, things like that happen. And I don't know that this is the best place to do that. This is a good format and I like what we're doing here. It's really awesome. But I'd really like to meet with a lot of y'all informally outside of a venue like this and so that when we do go before the county and the city, we can maybe, maybe come to the table with some things that, hey, we've already agreed on out in the world and we can move forward more quickly. Um, third, I think, um, I don't know that we've all done a great job of educating ourselves and each other about what some of these things are. I've spent the last week or two uh, re-educating myself about what bus rapid transit is. And I have to tell you, if you look up on the internet or on the wiki page for BRT, you see nothing but uh, you know, two million residents in a Chinese city and these big buses with 250 people on them and um, these really giant systems and segregated lanes. 
And what I see BRT looking like in Gainesville, from what I've been told and from what I've seen, it's not this big giant beast that a lot of us imagine it to be. And I would say the same thing about the bike ped facilities. A lot of them are very innocuous. Uh, you'd hardly notice them if you're in a car uh, driving next to them. And to, to be fair, I mean, I think that those of us that are interested in the more public forms of transit, uh, I don't think we've done a very good job of explaining a lot of these things to people and how they would actually look on the ground, how it would affect you personally, the time you will spend, uh, the less time you'll spend looking for that parking space because someone took the bus or rode their bike, all those kinds of things. If we can make those things sort of vis visceral and physical for people and really give them, thank you, uh, really give them a sense of what those kind of facilities will do to make their lives easier when they're in their cars, I think it would be easier to agree about the need for a lot of those things. Um, I think the, the education thing is probably the biggest thing I, I would offer tonight as a suggestion. Um, we need to be going out, um, whether it's staff, elected officials, stakeholders, into the community, not just among our peers, go out into that noisy, uncomfortable part of the world that maybe doesn't want to hear what you have to say, and explain to them exactly what the things are that you're looking to do and what you're willing to give up. I mean, uh, I know that, you know, I'm going to have to go back and tell um, my folks that, hey, guess what? Um, there's a lot of people that really want to fix some roads that don't have anything to do with cycling. And um, that's not going to be easy, but I'm, I'm going to do that. So thank you for the, the time, and uh, thank you for listening. I look forward to working with all of y'all. Appreciate it. Do we have a representative of the Gainesville Institute in the audience? They had requested to speak, but OK. Moving along then, we have the Gainesville uh, Area Chamber of Commerce. Brian Herring. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Brian Harrington. I'm on the Gainesville Area Chamber of Commerce uh, Public Policy Committee. Uh, unfortunately, tonight, Adrian Taylor, who is the architect of our recently published uh, policy statement on transportation, was not able to be here to deliver this presentation, so I'm his understudy. I uh, apologize for that, but I'll try to do it in his stead. Uh, you know, the Gainesville Area Chamber of Commerce represents 1,200 business members and their 70,000 employees. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity and the forum that you've provided for us to present what we think is the solutions for moving forward. So we're at a fork in the proverbial road. We've been here before in this community, and we have sometimes successfully navigated the correct path and other times not. And so the Gainesville Area Chamber of Commerce would like to emulate past successes that we've had collectively in moving forward. But to move forward first, we've got to understand where we are. What's our problem? Where do we go? How do we get there? And who is eventually going to be on board for the journey? So what's the problem? I'm not going to belabor the point. Crumbling infrastructure. I think we all acknowledge that that's a problem here in our community. Ballooning backlog. I think that's also pretty well identified. $550 million from the county's uh, staff presentation. Tack on a few hundred million dollars from the city's needs list. I'm sure the other outlying uh, municipalities have some money. Let's say we're just shy of a billion dollars of need. We've got finite resources. I'm not going to go into it. There are some other resources available, um, but these are the big ones. Gas tax, uh, if we were to pass some sort of sales tax or surtax at a penny a year, the con contributions by development, and then the money that we get, and that $10 million represents the average rate of what we get or are expecting to get um, for our long-range transportation plan from the MTPO's documents put together by uh, Marley's group. But one problem we've got here, and I think we've kind of acknowledged it, is there is an idea gap. Some people in our community are very much set on, we need to have what others have, like Portland, and have a light commuter rail system or streetcar system in our downtown for an urban circulator. Others believe that bus rapid transit, which was just discussed, it can be a lot of things. Some people feel that it needs to be a, a network that connects Santa Fe out to the airport with a majority of dedicated lanes, in some cases potentially even taking lanes from existing vehicle traffic. 
And still other people on the, on the other extreme believe that the transit system is fine. It deals with the University of Florida students. That's all it's intended for. It is satisfactory as is. And you know what? We just need to pave. We need to pave, pave, pave. And the chamber believes that um, if we can, and it's been our experience, not just in initiatives that we've undertaken, but in journeys that we've made to other communities to see how they solve their problems, that if you can deaden the noise from the perimeter, from the extreme, and you can focus on the center, there's a lot of opportunity to build consensus. And one thing is that, you know, there is a broken trust. And it's not just here in our county where citizenry has a distrust of elected officials. It's between here and Tallahassee and between here and Washington. Now, it might be perceived or it might be real, but in a lot of cases, perception is reality. And one way we can help alleviate that is introduce some measures of accountability and transparency so that everybody feels like they're part of the process, engaged, and they can see behind the curtain. So where do we go? Again, the crossroads. We oftentimes in this community want to look at our peer communities. Well, what are they doing up in Madison? What are they doing out in Eugene or in Austin or in Charlotte? But you know what? We can look right here in our own community for a great success story, and that was IG. IG was where do we go from here? How do we take all of the human capital that we've developed through our university system and make sure that they have an opportunity to stay here and help grow an innovative, green, sustainable economy? And I think the lessons learned in IG can be translated into success for transportation. So how do we get there? Priorities, solving that funding puzzle, identifying how we can introduce transparency, and then building advocacy through results. You know, identifying the priorities, road maintenance and capacity, I think everybody has identified our roads are in tough shape and need uh, some attention. And capacity, capacity is not just adding vehicle lanes, although that's an important component of it. It's also adding capacity through enhancing our tra transit service. But when you look at transit service, we wholeheartedly believe that we need to improve the great system that we already have. But there's a lot of talk of choice riders well, we also need to make sure that we look at all of those that are in need of transit as their only real means to get to and from work, to and from the grocery store. And we need to do things in our system, the low-hanging fruit that we can implement to enhance those services. And you know what? We're Innovation Gainesville. We are an innovative community. We have a lot of intellectual capital. We need to build a smarter city, and a lot of that can be put into our transportation network. Solving the funding puzzle, you know, there's a lot of vehicles, and this isn't all of them, for how you can put money towards solving our problem. Um, you know, we're open to talking about what method and means we meet uh, those challenges with. Probably going to wind up being some form of surtax or sale tax, surtax being a little more flexible for transportation and operations. You know, transparency, a lot of people have talked about a list. You know, there already are a lot of lists out there. Um, what the chamber would like to do is we would like to go out to all of the constituent groups in the community, not just those that are the strong advocates, but we want to talk to everybody involved, residents in East Gainesville. We want to talk to the university, not necessarily for their students, but for their employees that come not from within, but from without, from Putnam County and from neighboring counties to the west. And that, through creating that transparency, you help build back that trust we want to build advocacy through results. Well, what does that mean? These are three numbers, 51, 73, 82. That's York County, South Carolina. 1997, they had identified a serious need in their existing transportation infrastructure. And they knew that there was nobody with a magic solution as far as funding to fix it. So they were going to have to fix it from within. They came up with a plan. That plan had a list. That plan had uh, citizen oversight for transparency. That barely passed at 51%. They started implementing that plan over the next six years. And in 2003, with 73% approval, they passed the second phase of that same tax because they had demonstrated to their constituents and their citizens that they could be responsible and effective with those dollars. And 82% is what that measure passed by in the most recent election in 2010. Here in our own community, the Alachua County Public Schools, it was talked about before, they had a need identified because of state funding cuts that they were going to lose critical services such as nurses. Well, our community will support causes that we are passionate about, and we were passionate about our school children. And that passed, and it was passed because there was community effort. It passed because there was a plan. Here is what we're going to do with the money. Here's how we're going to use it. There was oversight. 
Lo and behold, that tax or that um, one mill came back up this past year and it passed with overwhelming success. Why? Because they had demonstrated proven results. If we can do that again here with transportation, I think we can have success. But to do that, we've got to have metric points. We can't have a tax that extends ad infinitum or a long-term period. We're targeting a four to eight year, so there can be that trust building, that accountability. And you know what? It might take five, seven, eight iterations of a referendum, but if we can build that trust and continue to build on it, we can see results like were found in York uh, County, South Carolina. You know, recently there was an uh, editorial in the Gainesville Sun, I see my two-minute card, uh, citing a book, uh, Good to Great, by Jim Collins, and specifically his analogy that had to do with, uh, ironically, a bus. And the idea being that you've got to have not only somebody driving that bus, but you've got to have the right people on that bus and in the right seats, and we wholeheartedly agree. And just like with IG, the chamber is looking forward to driving that bus and through community outreach, getting all the right partners, again, not just the advocates, but everybody that has a stake in this community's transportation system, getting them involved in the plan, <laughs> developing an equitable plan that deals with everyone's concerns to the best ability within the reason of funding and time, making sure that those measures of transparency and accountability are there. Have a list. Have that list overseen by a citizen's um, group, and then that helps to build that trust. Do it for a four to eight year period. Then come back to the citizens and say, citizens, here's what we did. If you approve of what we've done with your resources, give us another opportunity. This is a quote from Henry Ford. Coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. This identifies what IG was, and it identifies what our transportation situation in this county can be. And the chamber looks very much forward to driving that bus and with you all being on board. Thank you. Is there someone here from the Association of Realtors? Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, I am Tommy McIntosh and I am representing the Association of Realtors here tonight. If you're not familiar with our group, we have about 750 professional realtors that are members of our association. We're a very diverse group. My remarks tonight are going to be very brief because our board of directors has to approve anything that I come to you and tell you. And we haven't had enough time to build a consensus, uh, but we do have a few things that the board has authorized me to put before you. First of all, GACAR supports a balanced approach to address the transportation deficiencies throughout the county. It's our belief that all the citizens should see some sort of improvement. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here at this summit and what you're trying to accomplish. The second thing is the approach recognizes, we believe that balanced approach recognizes the importance of continuing to improve upon the public transit system in areas where the public transit system is being utilized by those who need it. We have some citizens that really depend upon the transit system yet do not have access. There are others who would use the system more if they were not asked to wait an excessive time between buses. There are others where the transit system would be viewed more positively if bus pullouts were available so the bus did not block traffic. Many of these things could dramatically improve the transportation system and should be considered in any proposed tax. The next thing that we would, that our board is, at, is uh, suggesting is the approach also place an emphasis on a pavement management system that will address the needs of the whole county. I think we heard the number $380 million in a prior presentation from your staff, and that number's not getting any better. That's a big number. GACAR also encourages transparent accountability for any public funds expended on this. There are several tools which could be incorporated to accomplish this, which may include, but not limited to, an identifiable project list which prioritizes how the funds would be expended, 
a report of funds collected and projects completed, and an independent oversight group that is charged with reporting to the taxpayers. All of these things for, we put for you to consider. Once again, thank you for seeking our input. We understand that tonight is a starting point. Um, we want to continue to be involved in this process as it goes forward, and we appreciate the invitation to be here tonight. Thank you. Is there a representative from the League of Women Voters? Thank you. I'm Billy Staff with the League of Women Voters. I also have a very brief presentation. I merely would like to state the League position at the national and state level. The League of Women Voters of the United States supports local and regional moves to improve mass transit and supports other alternatives such as express lanes for buses and carpools. The League of Women Voters of Florida supports public transportation projects which yield multimodal investments in local and state enhanced infrastructure. The League of Women Voters of Alachua County has not studied or addressed specific local transportation proposals and issues. We will support any local initiatives that follows the guidelines taken at the state and national level. Thank you for inviting us tonight. We look forward to going forward with this process. Next up is Open Alachua. And Hi, my name is Thomas Hawkins. Uh, I'm, in addition to being a Gainesville City Commissioner, uh, I'm, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of a political action committee called Open Alachua. I was going to begin by thanking the Alachua County Commission for having us here this evening, but I think I owe the, the thanks to everyone in this room for everybody's patience. Um, I will be brief, but not nearly as brief as Ms. Staff. Um, so as I mentioned, Open Alachua is uh, an organization in the community with a mission uh, to support growth of the Alachua County economy through investments in transportation. And specifically, Open Alachua is a political committee, which essentially means that it's uh, registered paperwork with the supervisor of elections so that it can get out there and spend money in support of uh, a, a political move to grow these transportation improvements in our, uh, in our community that will help grow our local economy. And the County Commission uh, has really asked two questions for us to talk about this evening. One is the kind of transportation system we want in order to improve our quality of life. And the second is what we can do to get that transportation system. I want to talk about the, the first question first, which is what, what is the transportation system that we want? Um, and Open Lachua is because it's specifically interested in growing the local economy, growing jobs in the local economy, and having a more prosperous community. We went to one of the sources of great information on how we build new places for people to work, how we build the homes that the next generation of people in our community are going to live in, and how we have that economic development happen. And one of the groups nationally that's working most aggressively towards this is the National Association of Realtors. And when you read what the National Association of Realtors says about transportation, they note that we're in a transition phase, and that the future really is going to depend on new modes of transportation, in particular transit, that they recognize as a catalyst for investing in our community. And they mentioned real estate development, but of course that means jobs and economic growth in our community. If you read some other documents by the National Association of Realtors, they even more tightly draw this connection between uh, what they call economic mojo and the kind of transportation investments that we need. And they say that we need transportation choice, which is a way to say that in addition to being able to drive, people should be able to walk or bike or ride transit. And they say that we need walkable neighborhoods, and the new development that we have should be a, of a walkable characteristic. And they point out this is not just good for the young folks who they see as new creative economy workers that are going to drive our job market forward, uh, but also people of, of other ages as well. And the good news is that that idea is already part of the 
plans we have for transportation in, in our community. Um, whether you read the City of Gainesville Comprehensive Plan, the Alachua County Comprehensive Plan, the Long Range Transportation Plan that's put together by the Metropolitan Transportation Planning Organization, or even documents like the Innovation Square Development Framework, which was put together by um, the developers of Innovation Square to look at what kind of infrastructure we're going to need to make that development a successful economic engine for Gainesville. And when you look at the Innovation Square Development Framework, it makes very similar points that the National Association of Realtors does. It recognizes that we're in a state of transition, that the future is going to be different than the past, which seems like a no-brainer, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that. And that secondly, what that future is, is a focus on transportation choices and a greater variety of options than we've had in the past. And to drive home this point that that's something that we're already doing and doing well, it's not just baked into our plans. When we really look at the numbers of what's happening and how people move in this community, it really is changing. So this chart shows um, what's been going on in transportation in our community in the last decade. This blue line uh, shows um, the change in student population at the University of Florida. And we've seen almost a 10% increase in the number of students at UF in the last decade. But at the same time, this yellow line is the Florida Department of Transportation traffic counts at the intersection of Hull Road and Southwest 34th Street, and it's going in the opposite direction than the number of students at UF. And that raises the obvious question, how is that possible? How can we have more students, which of course means more employees, more staff people, more faculty, and these lines are inversely correlated, and the answer is what happens on the third line, which is uh, riders on the regional transit system, and we now have about 11 mil million riders per year on the regional transit system. And that, of course, is what picks up the gap. So we're doing this, we're doing it well, it's something that we should be proud of as a community, but it brings us to the second question, which is, if we want to continue to go forward with it, what actions do we need to take to build that transportation system? Um, and I, I put up this slide, which is something that a lot of folks have, have alluded to, which is the results from both the school's referendum uh, last fall and the uh, roads referendum last fall, uh, to show that what we have done in the past won't work in the future, at least in terms of the funding conversation. Um, so as we know, the, the, the roads, uh, about one in three people voted in favor of. It did perform best in the city of Gainesville and worst in the suburban, area, the suburban and rural areas. Um, and it's pretty much the inverse of, of the schools, which performed well countywide and of course was, was passed at a margin of two to one. So Okanalachua thinks there's really four ideas that we need to look at to get it right this time. One is we have to have the right balance between repairing our existing infrastructure, as Mr. Serlanik talked about, but also planning for future economic development, providing things like the transit solutions that are going to help us in our future growth. And getting that balance right is going to be important. Uh, second is each local government needs to be in charge of the projects that directly benefit its citizens, whether it's uh, Mayor Cooper from the city of Alachua who's here this evening or uh, uh, Mayor Lowe from the city of Gainesville. One city can't make decisions for another and likewise the county can't make decisions for a city and no city should make decisions for the county. We need to work together to put together a plan, um, but, but no one community should, should veto projects in another. The projects that come together should address everyone, whether that person is a walker, a biker, a transit rider, or a driver. And then finally, we need to make decisions that are based on the best available data. And one issue that, that we, we're, we've started talking about a little bit that's very specific about the, the sales surtax that, that might or might not come, that a couple of speakers have mentioned, is the term of years. And I want to talk a little bit about it in terms of looking at the best available data. If you pull from the State Department of Revenue how much money would come in from a sales surtax, and you look at the Bureau of Economic and Business Research and its projections for how our population and economy are going to grow over the future, and you, you can get a picture from that of the cash flows that would come in from a sales surtax over a long period of time. And then you can look in the bond market for what uh, rate of interest a local government like Alachua County or the city of Gainesville would pay to bond those revenues. And pulling all those numbers together, uh, we can get a net present value um, for a sales or tax of a different number of years. Um, and those numbers range from in the area of about $80 million for a, an eight-year sales or tax to well over $200 million for a 32-year sales or tax. And the reason that I want to put those, those numbers up there is uh, all of them are very well below the orange line, which is the um, unfunded needs that Ms. Scott presented from the city of Gainesville and the blue line which is uh, not new capacity but just the road resurfacing backlog that Mr. Serlanik presented 
uh, from Alachua County. And the reason to put this out there is to show that there, there is a gap. Um, and, and that needs to be made up in, in two ways. One is uh, on the revenue side, finding the, the term of years that makes the most sense for revenue. And then, of course, um, on the expenditure side, we still have a lot of work to do to talk about exactly what projects we think are significant to fund. And that should be done in a cooperative fashion. So in conclusion, um, uh, again, would thank Alachua County and note that uh, Open Alachua is interested in supporting the process as it goes forward so that we can have the investments that, it's, that are going to grow the economy in Alachua County. Thanks. We have Mr. Martin here of the Rural Concerns Committee. My own little stopwatch going. Uh, my name is uh, John Martin, and I'm here representing the Rural Concerns Committee, which is a, a, a committee under the county's auspice. And we do exactly we try to do exactly what it says. We try to address rural concerns and make recommendations to the county for that. So I know we've been here a long time, but I got two pretty good pieces of good news. We've seen a lot of up and down news. One is that I'm not running for from anything at the moment. And the other is that I'm the second to the last speaker, I believe. So that ought to be something that make you excited. But I, I got a few prepared remarks. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the roads and how they specifically apply to the rural areas. And I, if I was going to ask a question, one question I would ask is, and I'm not asking it, but if I was, how many people actually traveled here by some I guess the proper term is carbon propelled vehicle. And I would venture to say that a large number of you did. Well, most of you, have, that I know a lot of you in this room, and a lot of you probably live within five or 10 miles of this location, because you probably live in Gainesville or the urban area. But imagine if you live in one of the outlying communities, that your probably average travel distance to this spot is about 20 miles. I know I've got to go all the way back to Hawthorne, which is probably 25 or 30 miles from here. But I want to read you a few things, and uh, first let me thank you for allowing me to be here, the opportunity to do the rural concerns and represent us. As such, I'm not here to advocate for or against any additional taxes, but to bring to your attention the, the importance of the road system to rural residents and businesses. My task today is to convince you that whether it's through additional tax dollars, which we've been discussing, or an allocation of current monies, it's your duty, the county commission, and obligation to maintain a road system that recognizes the special connection roads have, have to rural concerns. And according to their own reports that you've seen, and depends on how you look at the numbers, but the reports show that we have a backlog in road repair that is approaching half a billion dollars, and as a previous speaker said, it's not getting any better. And many of these roads are either in the rural area or impact rural residents' ability to access vital services. The condition of the roads is having a direct impact on the economy of all of Alachua County. And this impact is even greater in the rural areas because they have to travel more distances on roads to, and they don't have the mass transit options that, that you would have if you lived in the core of, of Gainesville. To illustrate this impact, I'm going to cover three areas. One is agriculture and the business behind it. Two is the general businesses that are in the rural area that many people may not be aware of. And third, something that is rarely talked about, but the fact that, Alachua, that Gainesville is the county seat of Alachua County, and therefore residents uh, have to travel into Gainesville from the rural area to assess a bunch of different um, uh, services that I'll get into in a moment. Uh, I, and I got a little folder here. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but this is from UF IFAS Extension, Alachua County, and it is available, I guess, online. But I just want to read you a few things, and this is specific to Alachua County. A lot of people may not know it, but the third largest employer in Alachua County is agriculture. How many people probably knew that? Its fourth total value of added of all industries. We're third in exports of things outside of Alachua County, which I think is pretty important. Here's a, st a statistic most people might not know. Agriculture provides 37,147 jobs, which is 23% of the county's workforce. P 
people are looking for work, agriculture is a way to go. I'm going to skip on down. I encourage you to look at this. But agriculture supports local businesses. $284 million in business sales average a year. 670, this is an interesting statistic, 679,000 in direct farm sales to CSAs, farmers markets, roadside stands, and you pick them operations. What that basically means is that you can buy local produce without having to travel as far, impact the roads right here through agriculture. And the, the, the main point I want to make to you is that agriculture, like other businesses I'm going to talk about in just a second, is very dependent on the road system specifically. Mass transit will not enhance agriculture and the ability to produce, produce these jobs. It not, does not mean that we're opposed to mass transit, but I think you need to realize that there is an impact economically directly behind roads. 54% of county land is used for agriculture. So if you like the environment in Alachua County, you can probably think a farmer. They own 54% of the land in Alachua County. 90, that's 340,000 acres. Here's something that's really interesting. 98% of farms in Alachua County are small farms, and 88% are individually or family owned. So we're not talking about a big corporate farming like goes on in other parts of the country. This is mom and pop businesses. These are your friends and neighbors if you live in the rural area, and they're providing a huge impact for you. So you need to keep that in mind. And once again, roads are a vital part of that. And I'm about halfway. Um, I won't get into any more of that. The, just understand the bottom line is that the value added impact to Alachua County is $255.4 million. And that comes from UF and IFAS. That's not from just this old country boy. All right. General business in Alachua County. I won't go through a long list of them, but we know that there are some major employment centers in the rural area. For instance, Alachua has the distribution centers up there. Newberry has the cement plant and now the sports parks that they're beginning to develop. And you can go around the county and see this. Some of the, the biggest tax impacts in the most recent years to property tax have actually occurred in the rural area. And every one of these businesses is very dependent upon the road system. And, and here's something else to keep in mind if you look at it. Even, even the biomass plant, I'm not making a statement about it, but even the biomass plant is going to be primarily dependent upon the road infrastructure to provide the fuel source to power that plant. And if you look at where the trucks are proposed to come from, they're going to impact the area that is already has a dense amount of, uh, of truck traffic. The third area of concern is the impact on rural residents to access services. Alachua County's communities are set up like spokes in a wheel, with the county seat being Gainesville at the center of this rural, of this, of this wheel. The communities access major government entities like the court system, the constitutional officers, the county commission, the school board, the library, you name it. If you're an Alts County resident, you have to travel into Gainesville on a regular basis. Add to these services like the airport and perhaps the most important, health care, and you can quickly see how vital the road system is to rural residents in addition to, a, and, and here's something else people don't think of. Someone else mentioned it earlier. In addition to Alachua County residents, many surrounding counties travel through our rural communities to access health care and employment. If you are from a small community, you've been on a city commission like me, you realize that a lot of the people traveling through your community are coming from other areas. A quick example of this is Putnam County. The number one employer of residents of Putnam County is the paper mill in Palatka. Number two is Shands Hospital in, in Gainesville. So we have a lot of people depending on our roads. And I am about to wrap this up. The last thing I want to say, I want to get this right. During last year's debate about the transportation sales tax, the issue of home rule and its role was often mentioned. As someone who has championed home rule, I would like to make a few brief comments. The state statute that sets up this sales tax gives home rule to the county and the county only. Counties are the branch of state government and, a power, and the power of this type of sales tax that's been discussed and before is administered by the counties as it was thought that counties could best assess the entire county needs. That is precisely what we at the Rural Concerns Committee are asking you to do. Whatever you decide to do, assess the entire county's need. 
This is not to say that cities shouldn't play a role in determining transportation needs, but this is a fairness issue and an efficiency issue, not a home rule issue. It's not a home rule. So I appreciate your time, and I look forward to talking to you. If you uh, would like to contact me, my email is very simple. It's bigjohnmartin at bellsouth.net, and I'd be happy to share this information with you. Thank you. We have two more groups. Uh, first up will be the Sierra Club. Is there a representative from the Sierra Club? Okay. And then next will be the Southwest Advocacy Group. So. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Dave Wilson. I'm the chair of the Swine St. John Sierra Club group. Uh, our group. Uh, goes all the way from the Suwannee River to the St. John's. It encompasses 15 counties. We have 1,700 members in our group, 800 of which live in Alachua County. So our executive board put together a statement. Uh, the Suwannee St. John's group of Sierra Club supports the concept of a comprehensive transportation plan that includes the, an interconnected grid network of roadways, limited roadway widening, increased rapid transit service, and an enhanced bicycle pedestrian system. In general, low density and cul-de-sac development should be avoided because they do not support mass transit. A multimodal approach will better enable our community to retain its livability despite possible increases in gasoline prices, population pressures, and reductions in federal and state funding for infrastructure. Sidewalks should be Required in new developments and given serious consideration when streets are repaved in existing neighborhoods. New developments should be limited to locations that are within the half a mile of existing or planned transit line. The county should also avoid the widening of current roads from two lanes to four lanes if possible. We support the position that the county dedicate 1% of its transportation budget to standalone bicycle and pedestrian projects. On a personal note, let me comment that I've lived in Gainesville 40 years. I taught 35 years in the math department at University of Florida, and I've always lived within three miles of my workplace. And uh, my lasting contribution, I think, I've always biked or walked to work. And I think my lasting contribution to the University of Florida is to have never purchased a parking decal. <laughs> and it's this livability that's come up on a number of these talks is really important to me. Uh, we've tr my wife and I and family have traveled all over the place and we've been to towns uh, that where the roads are wide the, and uh, you know you have en enormous infrastructure spent and they're very unpleasant. Just one example would be uh, in San Francisco last year. We drove from San Francisco to Chico to my cousin's retirement, and you're dealing with a freeway, which is not free, uh, but it's 10 lanes wide. Do you have people zinging in and out of you all over the place? Gainesville is so pleasant. I've now tried to take my uh, one-person tasks of going to the bank, the post office, the market downtown, to do that on my bike. And it, it's a very enjoyable experience, and I really think that uh, Gainesville has a lot to offer in these ways. And we would hope that you would keep this kind of uh, opportunity going. I think it really makes a difference. A couple of people have commented about people coming to Gainesville and, and finding it attractive because you do have this opportunity for different choices. You, don't have to necessarily drive to work, depending on your choice of living space. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. You think this is good? Good evening. My name is Joan Canton, and I'm re I represent the Southwest Advocacy Group, or SWAG which is made up of area residents, advocates, and service providers 
that strive to improve the health, well-being, and success of those living in the Tower Road area just west of I-75 in the 32607 zip code in southwest unincorporated Gainesville. Many of the issues that confront residents of this area are related to transportation. Due to distances between the complexes, residents who would utilize the services offered face problems in getting to the center. We believe that it is important that both the bus service and the streets be made more accommodating to the needs of residents. In order to accomplish this, it is important that the total multimodal system be informed of the unique needs of our area. We are therefore requesting that you consider the following. The opening of Southwest 8th Avenue will make it easier for residents to be able to utilize our services. We are also asking that you keep in mind the importance of installing sidewalks on the, on the north side of Southwest 24th Avenue and the completion of sidewalks on the south side of Southwest 24th Avenue from Portofino to the overpa overpass of I-75. At present, there is a safety issue for residents who must walk over the bridge to connect with buses on 62nd Boulevard. Therefore, we, we request that a safety buffer be considered, such as the ones on 23rd Avenue near Santa Fe Community College and the 13th Street overpass. Many families find it necessary to use this bridge and the dangers of walking over it with strollers and small children are obvious. We further request that this bridge be lighted as many residents work a late shift and find it necessary to cross it late at night and early mornings when the number 75 bus stops running. With no lighting, they are often not visible to traffic and the danger of bodily harm is greatly increased. We ask that Southwest 8th Avenue not be open solely as a thoroughfare with vehicles traveling at a high rate of speed as this will threaten both the safety and cohesiveness of residents of both Linton Oaks and Hidden Oaks Mobile Home Park. The constant movement of cars through these neighborhoods will endanger children riding bikes or walking and playing in the area. It is important to note that we are attempting to make residents more aware of their health and to that end, we are encouraging the use of neighborhoods as places to walk as well as to meet and greet neighbors. We would like also to encourage you to consider a net network of rapid transit facilities that would connect with the major employers. This service would greatly support residents lacking personal vehicles and assist them in reporting to work in a timely manner by eliminating the many bus changes required to get to their final destinations. Our neighborhoods are served by the number 75 bus. The first buses do not reach our area until well after 6 a.m., which means that it arrives at the Oaks Mall after 7 a.m., which is the transfer point to board the buses that will take them to their jobs. This makes it impossible for them to be at their jobs for 7 a.m. Many of our residents work in the service industry and are required to work shifts from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and 3 to 11 and 11 to 7, etc. When residents get off from work at 11 p.m., there are no buses to our area, the last number 75 bus having ended at 7.20 p.m. This requires residents to walk from the Oaks Mall to 20th Avenue, then walk over the unlit bridge with no safety buffers between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. We therefore request that the needs of our area be considered when planning to change the system to more adequately, adequately service the many needs of Alachua County residents. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers who took time to be here this evening. We're going to now take a 15 minute break and when we return from our break, we'll hear from members of the public who would like to speak and who have filled out a speaker card. So if you would like to speak and you still haven't figure, er, filled out your speaker card, please do so during the break and give your speaker card to the man in the green shirt. 
So we'll reconvene at 8.32. Great, thank you. Good break, lots of conversation. Our first speaker in the public input section is actually someone that we may have overlooked in the earlier reservation section. Ellen Voss from the city of Hawthorne is going to make a uh, talk on behalf of the city of Hawthorne. And Ellen, you get 10 minutes as you would have if we had proper, put you in the proper, and then we'll move on to the public comment. Thank you. And Ellen, your speaker timer is going to be right here to tell you when you're up. Hi, good evening, and thank you very much. On behalf of the city of Hawthorne, I'm Ellen Voss, the city manager. Our mayor and commissioners all both thank you for the opportunity for us to give you some input tonight. Basically, this, um, the opportunity for us to get a uh, additional funding source to do maintenance on the city roads in Hawthorne is something that we desperately need. And I think the commission did an excellent job on our first kickoff try. Uh, you did a remarkable thing of getting all nine municipalities to agree to an interlocal agreement. And in that interlocal agreement, we gave you our list. And I think you heard tonight that accountability, transparency, and uh, trust were the, the key elements that you talked about. Our list hasn't changed. Our needs are still there. We have 13 miles of roads that need either resurfacing or some court, sort of chip seal to it. And we did a great job of getting started. And we got it off the ground, and we headed down the road, and we hit that pothole. And that pothole was BRT. But you're hearing for the input from the citizens here tonight, and I think they're saying that certain communities have certain needs. Our rural communities have the, just the need for the funding source to do maintenance. I have a sister city in the audience. Her city of Waldo is no different. Alachua and Newberry are here. I believe their needs are no different, but we um, appreciate being included, and I think it's going to take cooperation from everyone, and the, the process and the second level of us going forward is something that we look forward to and hope that we can have some input to. So thank you. Okay, for the members of the public that are going to speak next, you have five minutes to speak. I'll call two of you, the first one, Warren Nielsen, if you'll come to the podium, and then the second speaker is David Coffey. And David, if you would go ahead and come up and sit over to the side so that we can move people through quickly. We'll always have one person in the queue. Um, speakers, you have five minutes, and again, Mr. Fay in the green shirt will let you know when you have one minute left and then when you your time's need. up. So. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Carol made a very important point, uh, point at the beginning of tonight's event about the need for us to listen and to collaborate. Let me just offer one person's long-term, 45 years lived in Gainesville perspective. We've never passed, to my recollection and in my history, a transportation referendum for a sales tax. The last one failed by 66% against. No precinct in Gainesville supported it. I did support in concept and I do, as a, man, as a citizen, feeling the responsibility of it, maintaining our infrastructure and our roads. I do that, I say that very honestly to you right now as a matter of responsibility. I also very strongly support the future of this community with respect to transit and different fo forms of transit and effectiveness of transit within the urban context and in the outlying areas. We will not pass any referendum in this community unless we all collaborate, come together with respect to road maintenance and our transit system. We're wasting our time. We need to incorporate that whole picture. Transit should be approx is approximately only 25% of what we're talking about. So I urge everybody to consider the fact that we have a bright future to embrace. Let's not waste our time. Let's come away from this working hard to fine polish the details and come up with a really dynamic proposal, get the citizens behind it, and let's pass this process. Thank you. Fred Pratt, if you would join the speaker's queue where Mr. Coffey was just sitting. 
Is Fred Pratt here? Oh, hi, Fred Pratt. Good evening, my name is David Coffey and I've been a resident here for 40 years, uh, much of that in uh, public life and most recently heavily involved in uh, the creation of transit oriented developments. And I have every reason to believe that I will continue to be here until the day when my brood of children and ever expanding grandchildren say to me, Dad, we're taking the keys away. And at that point, I don't want to be stuck, as the term we've been using here this evening. And it's because of that that I am here this evening speaking. And you've asked, well, what is it that people would like for their transportation? What kind of place would they like to live and work in? And then what's the most important steps for uh, achieving what they like, what they want? Uh, I've already messed this up. And to answer that question, I think we have to look at, well, who are the people? And if you look nationwide, you see that by far the largest segment of our population is Generation Y, the young ones, my, son, my children and grandchildren, and the baby boomers, of which I am a member. And if you look at Florida, it is still by far the two largest segments of our society. And in Gainesville in particular, Generation Y is likely to be even larger. Well, what are the home builders saying? In this article from Builders Magazine, it says, hear them roar. The millennials, that's Generation Y, make up almost a third of the US population and they will fundamentally change how you do business, speaking to the home builders. And then Wall Street Journal reports that uh, at a National Association of Home Builders uh, convention that here's what Generation Y does not want. They do not want formal living rooms, soaker bathtubs, and the dependence on a car. Well, the Urban Land Institute has been studying these issues and documenting trends in real estate development and have been telling us for a number of years now that the uh, emerging trends suggest that what people want is transit-oriented development. Here they're reporting three years in a row that that's the top investment uh, for real estate. Well, and then the real estate crashed, so what are they saying now? Here's a quote from the Urban Land Institute. Living smaller, and this is from 2012, living smaller, closer to work, and preferably near mass transit holds increasing appeal as more people look to manage expenses wisely. Interest cools on offices, especially suburban office parks. More companies concentrate in urban districts where sought after Generation Y talent wants to locate in 24-hour environments. And then this year, the large Generation Y demographic cohort orients away from the suburbs to more urban lifestyles, and these young adults willingly rent shoebox size apartment units as long as neighborhoods have enticing amenities with access to mass transit. U.S. News and World Report, much the same in their uh, discussion of real estate trends, indicating that there are demographic shifts and changing values that increase demand for pedestrian-friendly, mixed-use communities in both urban and suburban settings. Uh, the RCLCO, uh, the nation's top real estate investment advisory firm, documents these trends, and you see it on the bar all the way to the far right, Generation Y, which has by far the biggest segment wanting to live in cities, urban areas. And what is it when that Generation Y is asked among a lot of different variables, including nearness to transit, what is it that they most want and value the most? And it is walkability, by far their top priority. Uh, and Innovation Square, Innovation uh, Economy in Gainesville is designed to capitalize on that. And I'm gonna skip through a couple of slides to go to uh, the, uh, what the National Association of Realtors is saying. Uh, Open Alachua uh, showed you some of what they're saying, and they're saying that TODs are the top choice in the market. Innovation Square represents a significant opportunity to transform the way we develop the world in which we live. This is taken straight from their, the Innovation Square documents. It is predicated on the idea that decisions should be made that offer the best possible outcome relative to our vision 
and goals, decisions based on thoughtfulness and research, not merely the repetitious, uh, repetition of previous models. These simple, clear, and permanent elements are foregrounded in the plan for Innovation Square and reinforced through the basic principles, livability, walkability, adaptability, and sustainability. And it begins its report, and this is my last slide, by, by quoting Charles Darwin and saying, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. It is at last time that we heed this truth and give our community an opportunity to embrace livability, walkability, adaptability, and sustainability by funding a mobility system that is not merely a repetition of previous models. Give the voters of our community the option to fund a multimodal system that is truly transformative, yet let them approve a sales tax that implements the multimodal vision already articulated by the city and county and do it for enough years to make a difference. And in my view, and based on all the data and information I've seen, that requires at least 16 years. Thank you. Nathan Scope, if you would take the seat in the queue. Uh, I'm here to speak about the uh, uh, the need for transportation outside of Alach uh, outside of uh, Gainesville for people with uh, we have a lot of people with uh, disabilities and people who are elderly who don't have a car who have no way of getting from Hawthorne or Alachua or Newberry or Micanopy to Gainesville other than uh, having somebody bring them and pay to bring them or uh, if they're lucky enough, they can use MV, but there are a lot of people that are not eligible for MV in this county. So uh, we need to have, uh, also, we, also we need to have uh, a better service and a more consistent service all through uh, the city of Gainesville. Uh, there are places where uh, buses are, are there every half hour and they're fine and it runs that way almost all day long uh, into the night. There are places in Gainesville where it starts out every half hour, then it kind of, it kind of goes down. You get an hour wait, an hour and a half wait. Uh, so that, uh, that's uh, uh, why I'm talking about uh, <coughs> having a, uh, a multimodal, as they're calling it. Uh, you know, I'm not against uh, improving our roads. I drive on uh, 16th Avenue. I'm lucky I have a car. I drive on 16th Avenue. I get up in the Millhopper area and I see some of the bad areas, the bad roads up there. And I'm not against that. But uh, what we need is uh, a system where everybody can get to where they need to go. And that's my, that's my thing to say. Thank you. Sabrina Newman, if you would take the cue seat. Is Sabrina? Good evening, uh, Nathan Scott. <clears throat> Just wanted to uh, remark that tonight marks the beginning of an open discussion about the future transportation needs of Alachua County. The guiding principles should be fix our roads and restoring the public trust and confidence in local government. How our roads got into such a state of disrepair is a completely separate matter that reflects poorly upon our elected officials and the manner in which they misappropriated taxpayer money. Looking forward, however, we need to balance, we need a balanced approach towards maintaining our existing roads and improving our transportation infrastructure as alluded to by the chamber presentation this evening. Their four year tax proposal is a proposal that is worthy of consideration, but any proposal beyond that is at their own peril. As reported in the Gainesville Sun on April 4th, Gainesville's plan 
favors spending over $80 million on BRT over repairing the roads, and also favors spending nearly $80 million for a downtown streetcar over improving the existing headways for the existing bus service in East Gainesville. Commissioner Hawkins, during his presentation tonight, said that we need to move forward with these initiatives in a cooperative manner. Based on the Gainesville Sun article, however, this seems to be preordained. And this preordained notion seems to be created, uh, predicated upon creating an artificial demand to support and justify pushing us towards their own preferred modes of special interest transportation, such as bus rapid transit and trolleys. In turn, Mayor Lowe on the campaign trail talks about being the only candidate who proposed a dedicated funding source for these projects. Let's be honest, Mayor Lowe, Funding for the city's discretionary expenditures requires another tax. And simply put, the citizens of Alachua County do not trust our elected officials to spend their money in a fiscally responsible manner. That's been proven time and time again. And so while the city commission is free to postulate that this tax was overwhelmingly rejected by the voters of Alachua County merely because it did not contain multimodal aspects, I would say it's because the citizens of Alachua County do not trust our elected officials to spend this money and, and would not support a 15-year tax. So what it comes down to is that we need to fix our roads and we need to improve our transportation. But the citizens of Gainesville cannot continue to afford the luxuries and discretionary spending of the Gainesville City Commission. Let's put this into further perspective. Over the past three years, the majority of the people in this room and 93,000 GRU customers have been overcharged approximately $23 million in excess fuel charges to hide the true rate impact of the biomass contract. That is tantamount to fraud and civil theft. The public was never told about this until late last year when GRU was caught. Our city commissioners who ask us to support this tax has, have refused steadfastly to refund this money to GRU customers. The Alachua County Commission is also a large user of power in Alachua County, and they have been overcharged. And I know that uh, Chair Byerly has lamented in the past about last year's budget not having the money to fund social services, which are a worthy cause. But for me, if the County Commission's not going to ask GRU to return their overcharges, and yet look to me to dip into my pocket and tax me so you can support your budget, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. Let's, next, let's talk about the biomass contract, $3.1 billion over the next 30 years. This project has nothing to do with natural gas prices, has nothing to do with the economy, it has everything to do with failure to mitigate risk prior to entering into the contract. Had they had firm contracts in place to sell this overpriced electricity at $130 per megawatt hour, we would not be having this discussion. But the fact remains is the people in Latchua County are struggling to pay their bills, to pay their mortgage, to put food on the table. And yet we're asking them now to approve an initiative in 2014 and to say, trust us spending your money. And so in closing, I would support, if I were inclined, to vote for something that would improve our roads. I would not support a tax in duration of four years. I think that's adequate time to demonstrate and restore the trust that you can repair our roads with the money collected. And finally, any tax that uh, supports or favors multimodal transportation, like bus rapid transit or trolleys, over fixing the roads, I think is dead on arrival. Thank you. Todd Chase, if you'll take the speaker's cue. Hi, my name is Sabrina Newman. I've been a resident of this county in Gainesville for a few years now and a member of Generation Y. And as I think about things that my generation needs and thinking about the transportation we use, I don't hear people in my generation complaining about the overpacked buses. I hear them complaining about the buses that are already on the road causing traffic. And when I look at this question, how will I help get this community unstuck when it comes to transportation? I think of how I get stuck in the potholes on the roads, not how I want more buses or trolleys or things like that. So I think our main point here and what we should be working towards is fixing the roads we have now 
and not adding more things that we don't necessarily need that others just want. Thank you. Lori Newsom, if you would take the QC. Good evening. Uh, my name is Todd Chase, and I'm a uh, city commissioner in Gainesville. Um, tonight, I'm really primarily speaking to you uh, as a commission, as a citizen. Uh, sadly, the three of you have recently signed a letter, along with effectively all of my colleagues on the city commission, saying that other opinions aren't really listened to, and, and they're really not welcome. So I'm talking to you as a citizen, because I'm going to vote for this thing at some point. Um, what I hope you take away from tonight is that we have to be open and, and, and willing to put forth something that will pass. That, sh that has to be the priority. Um, I'd encourage you to find something not that just might pass, but that will pass. I would, I would shoot for a target of 70%. I would make sure there's no organized opposition. You've heard a lot of thoughts tonight, some of them new, uh, some of them some of them old. But uh, what I want to focus on is is not what we can do if it passes, I really encourage you to have at the forethought of your mind what we won't be able to do if it fails. And I think that for me was my most important thing last year. Um, and so as you listen to people in the different groups talking about term, as you hear them talking about uh, what it goes to, you know, focus on that. I mean, at some point there's gonna be elected officials from all over the county that, that hopefully can get on board and support this and talk to their citizens and everybody that does follow us. But I'll talk about what we won't be able to do. What we won't be able to do is the two young men that I know that work at Groove Shark who have to leave work every day early because the bus stops running and they live in the Northwest and they want to ride the bus. They have to ride the bus. And there's people like that all over the town. We heard some cases earlier with the uh, the uh, woman from the swag area, that, 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 that's, a, that's a concern. Those people will lose. The, uh, there's, there, there's not as many here, but there were some senior citizens here that, that, that were, were here tonight. And uh, what I'll tell you is that just one mile down the road from here, one mile, are two neighborhoods called Turkey Creek Forest and Whitney Park. And they're, they're full of senior citizens, many that can't drive. And we can't go pick them up. We can't pick them up and bring them here, and we can't pick them up and bring them anywhere because the bus stops here. And we all know, if you're in office, you know what it costs to add a little bit of a route or add another stop, and that's the kind of things that we need. And so we have to focus on not, not 30 years from now, but getting to 30 years gradually and offering citizens what, what's needed today. And I can assure you this, that uh, you know, shortly before my mother's death, I thought, the worst thing about what she went through was being on oxygen. And she was on oxygen for a couple years. And she said something to me that will, that will impact me the rest of my life. And I hope you think of this when you do this, because someone else mentioned it earlier. And she told me that the worst part of the life that she led in the last few years was losing her ability to drive, period. And if you've never been through that, or if you've never had a loved one who you've had to take care of day in and day out, the guilt they feel, the calls they make. They can't get to places. And so we can service them and, and we can help them. And I think that's important. Again, these are basic things. And all around this town, we are one mile or two miles away from extending routes that would make a lot of sense. And those are the kind of things that I think, again, everybody could consider. This is like a city commission meeting. That's awesome. Okay. Um, so again, I just hope you can stay open and, and again focus on what will pass today and and what can pass and then what we can prove to people in the future that they can they, they can trust their all of us and, and and the county commission in particular i mean you're in charge of this because these this is your this is your area that you're you're responsible for and so uh, surely we'll work together so i mean just in closing again i hope that one of the main thoughts is not what we can do but what we won't be able to do if it fails. And so I encourage you to, to listen. I encourage you that if you don't feel the way that, that, you, that you feel like when I start off tonight, because I gotta be honest with you, I'm struggling with reading that. 
I really am. Uh, so it's, it's just one of the saddest things I've, I've, I've read or seen since I've been in office, and I, I know that you're better than that. So I hope you will listen to my opinions. I hope you'll listen to the opinions of everybody here, and, and I look forward to supporting something that we can collectively pass together. Thank you. Mary Frances Feltz Donali. I'm kind of small, but I'll get on my toes. There, that's okay, I'm good. I'm gonna be just two seconds. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. I've been before the commission on numerous occasions in the same capacity that I address everyone tonight, that is as a taxpayer and a business owner in Lachua County. I've been here many, many years. I do have a payroll that we make every two weeks. So I'm in a unique position of knowing what would probably work best. I know there are a lot of great minds here tonight and I've appreciated all the comments. So that being said, Having listened in my position as a business owner and an employer um, and as a concerned citizen and having listened to many studied minds on all the issues, I just want the commission to keep in mind, please, two things. One, we can't afford everything. We simply can't afford it. I'm a taxpayer. Um, I do not get subsidized under any circumstances, and so consequently, any tax that is proposed and voted upon comes out of my pocket very, um, with very much impact. That being said, I do like sales taxes. I do not like property taxes. Sales taxes means that everyone that participates um, pays, so I think that is a wonderful way to tax the citizens when the need arises. So in closing, as we move forward, I would hope that the commission would take into account our current circumstances, stances, which are dire um, roads, crumbling roads that are now unsafe, and the fact that for far less money than an elevated elitist vision for the city of Gainesville, we could in fact work on our current bus system to do all that Mr. Chase has proposed. We know there's ways to do it. We could do it in a much more economical fashion than rapid transit, and I would just hope you would keep that thought in mind. I think that that would serve the citizens far more, um, and far more efficiently and economically than the vision of bus rapid transit and trolleys. Thank you very much. Luis Diaz. Hello, I'm Mary Frances Foles Donahue. I'm the president of the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1579. We represent uh, the bus drivers the mechanics, maintenance workers, vehicle service attendants, clerks, customer service agents, and administrative personnel of the Gainesville Regional Transit System. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak and thank you for inviting me here. Um, what I'd like to share with you mostly is not necessarily official policy of ATU. We're working on a position paper about the future of Trans in Electric County. So mostly what I'm going to present to you is informational that hopefully will help you make decisions in the future. Um, I'd like to start out by saying that RTS is a success story. It's a publicly operated, efficient, and productive system. Looking statewide, Gainesville actually has some of the highest productivity, if not the highest productivity, in terms of the number of residents of the Gainesville metropolitan area versus the number of passenger trips that we have per year. So when our peak ridership happens, which is the beginning of the fall semester, when UF goes back into session, we actually have a higher daily ridership than Jacksonville Transit, which of course is a much larger metropolitan area. Of course, our transportation is seasonal, so the amount of service we provide in this summer and the amount of ridership that we have shrinks a lot. And uh, what hasn't been mentioned before is it's actually impacts working people in a negative way because they often lose their trip home from work uh, when we cut back service in the summer. Okay, so 
transit is very important to economic development. First of all, good paying civil service jobs have a multiplicative effect throughout the community, which is what transit has provided dignity and a path out of poverty for many of the employees of the transit system. But furthermore, it also provides a path out of poverty for the working families who depend on transportation for access to education, to healthcare, and most importantly, to jobs. So in a sense, transit becomes a subsidy for minimum wage employers whose wages do not cover the cost of transportation for that employee. So without the bus actually providing access to those workers, the business in fact suffers at the same time those workers who don't have access to job opportunities end up on public assistance or end up with serious problems in the home that are caused by poverty. Um, just get to my next point. I scribbled a lot of stuff down here. Um, there's some bad news and some good news for Elijah County. The, the bad news is that a, a lot of transit agencies depend on federal funding and DC likes to provide a lot of shiny money for capital enhancements, does not like to provide support for operating funds. So that usually has to come from the local community. Ladshook County has not been able to provide operating assistance, which is why routes like 75 are underfunded. <clears throat> um, we're also a little bit too large to be considered really small rural community that would get special funds from the government. We're kind of in a middle state, although Florida has recognized our excellence in transportation and is providing some funding. So um, there's, a, there's a few needs that I see personally with my experience in transportation and I've heard people tell me, um, you know, as I go around the community, one is that we're not providing service intercity in Alachua County, we don't provide service daily to and from the small cities and Gainesville where a lot of the jobs are. Um, the good news is that an express bus service does not create a shadow paratransit um, requirement. So there are some ways around some of the funding issues that might make it inaccessible. Um, please, when you're designing streets, don't forget about uh, bus drivers. Uh, buses are much wider than cars, um, and you have to keep 18 inches between yourself and a bicycle. So if you put a narrow lane and a bike lane, you're essentially causing the bus driver to break the law if you're trying to make that a mixed-use street. Um, also, the bus pullouts do not work very well uh, on multi-lane streets. A lot of times they're not actually long enough for a bus to safely pull all the way in and pull all the way out. Um, among other issues. I obviously don't have time to get into that too much. Um, I'd like to see the county expand the share, the scope of services like ride share and van pools that might be more appropriate for smaller communities. Uh, RTS could become a coordinator for that. There may be special funds available and a limited uh, input by the city or the county could really expand the scope of what's out there, carpooling and van pooling, especially for smaller groups to get access to work and thank you. Wilbur Holloway. Um, oh, uh, my name is uh, Luis Diaz. I'm always a little too tall for this thing. Um, I, uh, I'll briefly tell you my, uh, my, uh, my views on this point. Uh, as, as many of you who may know me know that I'm a big fan of TNDs and, and TNDs, uh, uh, TODs. Um, but the one thing that I want to just express my, my quick, quick viewpoints about this. First of all, as you all know, we, we live in a county that employs a lot of people that live outside of our, our county. Um, they tax our roads and they don't pay any, any income for, to service those roads. And unfortunately, we have the gas tax maxed out. So we are, our choices are very limited right now to have come up with fundings. I think personally that the, the defeat of the, the last referendum on, on tax was unfortunate because of course we have more, 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 more costs now because of that delay. Um, but honestly, to tell you the truth, I know that we're trying to find a solution for this. I think that we're, if we got to think hard how we're going to pass this referendum now if we want to make it part of transportation. And I'm, I, 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 Start to be the pessimistic about the whole issue, but if we 
didn't pass that, that one first. And the only reason I think it didn't pass is because the city was opposed to it and we had a lot of uh, advertisement against it. Uh, so a lot of people decided to vote uh, against it, unfortunately. But the, the thought is now that we're going to pass the tax referendum, uh, including the, the, the uh, transportation with it. My problem is, as a lot of people, is, is the perception that people do not have a, a something to hang on to that they can, they can see and, and, and naturally be for it. I mean, the, 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 always there's the bias like in transportation issues because they're, they're not like other transportation cities like Eugene or San, or, or San Luis, or other places where they have seen the samples of those things working. But it takes a lot of money to get there. And I, I, I think that we want to be careful how we move forward. Of if we try to be too overambitious, that's the only thing I'm afraid of. If we're trying to do too uh, lofty of goals, they're not achievable. I think I'm a big fan of doing uh, 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 lanes and, and multimodal systems, but the funding is going to be very critical. We know the gap is immense between those, uh, those services. So uh, again, I want for you, for you guys to think hard about what is the need that we need currently right now. And it's urgent for us to do the, uh, the pavement uh, service. Uh, it's obvious about that. So let's prove that there is a, um, let's do a system. For example, Eugene uh, and, and St. Louis, when they came and presented at the Thomas Center, uh, they spoke that all of the systems go f no more than four miles from the city center. Uh, that's the furthest they go out. And here we're talking about doing some systems. There are 12 miles out for city center. So that's extremely ambitious. And I grant you, that will happen. It will eventually will happen, whether or not we say five years, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now. But if we go, we're going to hold hostage a, a, a need for funds on a, some form of referendum because we can't get any more tax money, again, we don't want to set ourselves for failure um, uh, moving forward. And let's think hard how we're going to sell this to the public because I, I think that if we think that it didn't, it didn't get passed because it didn't have the transportation in it, then you're fooling yourself, I'm sorry to say. But let's, let's be realistic about this and come to consensus. Lastly, I'd like to uh, put my uh, K-Museum hat on. Uh, on the two MTPO meetings ago, um, there was a need for um, the city and the county to come to agreement to doing the Main Street of um, uh, section that's going to be right in front of the K-Museum. It's going to be a great project for the whole community. And the county and the city cannot agree on this, that segment of road. Let's see if it's possible to have the city and the county come up with a consensus where they can come to the middle ground so we can move forward to a great project for this community and fix Main Street uh, all the way to uh, uh, 16th Boulevard. Thank you. Nancy Darren. Uh, thank you. Uh, getting unstuck involves trust. Uh, I found it interesting that the staff's presentation um, presented several hundred million dollar transit expansion projects and then got around to addressing uh, maintenance of existing infrastructure while our roads fail. Uh, while I'm happy that we are having this discussion, I'm not confident that this, sub this summit will yield anything other than political cover uh, for the city and county to pursue their overly ambitious goals. Uh, I offer an evidence uh, just recently, uh, Commissioner Thomas Hawkins' recent request for $100,000 of taxpayer money to study a downtown trolley system which may not be built for God knows, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years. It's going to be a while, uh, while our roads uh, molder. And then another uh, $100 million from the feds to study it further. Uh, I noticed in the staff's presentation uh, that, uh, that they didn't project out beyond 10 or 15 years uh, and they only addressed four or five favored multi-use developments and for this you're asking me, the citizen and taxpayer, to pay for this while our roads are failing. Uh, what do I, okay, so that was kind of a setting the stage. Our moderator uh, set the stage, so, you know, was all that constructive? I don't know, it set the stage, it goes to trust. Um, what would I like to see from this transportation summit? I, I, am, I implore you, give me something. Give me a show of faith that you will make fixing existing infrastructure a priority. A show of faith 
would, would be to assure the citizens and taxpayers that BRT doesn't mean lane narrowing, dedicated bus lanes, or centi-million dollar trolley systems. That's way down the future. There's, I've heard several speakers, speakers say that there, there is a misunderstandings regarding transit. Please assure me, city commission, county commission, assure me. I shudder to think of the, the metric tons of CO2 that have been spent clarifying this issue. Why am I still confused? How come no one will tell me you're not gonna take, you're not gonna take travel lanes away? that you're not gonna have express buses. I mean, I, 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 actually, let me retract that. I am in favor of, of express buses. I think that's a great idea. But to take travel lanes away uh, from, from, from existing traffic with the problems we're having doesn't make any sense. I support, I support express buses and bus turnouts. I support better use of existing services. I support better use and respect for my tax dollar. I support limited tax to be reviewed, to be renewed only if the commissioners demonstrate good stewardship, and I would really like to see trust in my local, local officials restored. Thank you very much. Gina Mastro de Casa, and if the speakers would remember to identify themselves at the beginning of their talk. I'm Nancy Darren, a citizen here. Uh, I really appreciate this effort to bring things together. I hear lots of common ground, and I had to chuckle about uh, the stuck place, because with my clients, I use that a lot, of if there's one thing you can do, you're stuck. If you're two, you're in a dilemma. Who's going to win and who's going to lose, and nobody wants to be in that, that losing position. And if you're at three to six, you're at choice, and you have options that breaks through that dam of the stuck place of a dilemma, which is what it seems like we have been in here. So I'm really appreciative tonight that there are a lot of places of common ground from the things I've heard tonight, and I hope we can keep developing that and move into that three to six place, our choices range where we're at choice. Um, I think it's critical to keep a variety of options open as we go forward. We're a vibrant, creative community and we want to protect that. We have an extensive, wonderful, rural agricultural community and we want to protect that. We have to consider people who would love to be out walking but are not able to, our elders, handicapped, um, people who live too far away, the, the rural, the poor, all the vulnerable citizens for whom transportation costs are such a major impact. Um, my concern is, again, that we, re that we normalize transit from a variety of choices because there are so many different needs. And another thing that I worry about or am concerned about and use as a construct is that transportation is all about liquid fuels. It's about oil. And we're at $100 a barrel oil, and energy scarcity is a big issue going forward, and I'm really concerned we're always going to play catch up unless we do use the creativity that we have here, looking at diverse options for transit, and it's, it, maybe it's larger thing, um, buses and small vans and jitneys and, and maintaining infrastructure. It's gonna be a variety of things, but looking at efficiency and how we can, uh, looking at community investing, there are many, many directions we can go, but asphalt is oil too, and that's, again, going back to the concerns about oil and prices of energy, is are there other surfaces that we can look at that would not be as costly going forward? Um, do we focus on certain roads to surface in a certain way? Um, my granny and grandpa live were rural apple farmers in southern Illinois, and my granny 
would get on the train in Cobden in the morning and go to the next town and go to the library and go to Woolworths and then she'd get on the train going the other way. And I can re well remember being in the rural Midwest um, a long time ago, uh, but we used to have more diverse options, especially for rural and poor people and folks who, who didn't have ready access. So that needs to be part of it, but certainly the vibrant, urbane, Gen X, um, walkable communities. I, I was just in Burlington, Vermont a couple of weeks ago, and having, having that kind of um, draw and excitement and bringing people in, it, it creates a vortex of a very exciting community. And this is the only county I would live in in Florida, and I think we can do this. So thank you. Melinda Kogan. Hi, I'm Gina Masterdy Casa, and thank you very much for everybody being here and sticking with it. I know it's been a long night, so thank you to the County Commission also. I think we're actually at a very good place after hearing from so many different stakeholders tonight, and, and I would want to take a bit of a positive spin on this. The, the question is, how will I help to get this community unstuck when it comes to transportation? I, what I've heard tonight, there's a lot of common ground out there. There's actually a whole lot of common ground from all the invited presenters and many of the people who spoke here tonight. What you heard is people do want to have an investment in transportation to grow our economy. It benefits everybody. You heard pretty much across the board support for various forms of transportation, including road resurfacing, pavement management, pedestrian, bicycle, transit. I do think that that is what the community wants. I also think that you heard from many of the stakeholders, they want transparency. They want to know what's going to be on the list. I can't imagine trying to even think it would be okay to tr pass anything without such a list. So of course there'll be a list, it'll be a good list, it'll be one that enough people can agree on. And you get input from the stakeholders, you get it from advocates, you get it from local governments. You know, you, you ask the city of Hawthorne, what does Hawthorne need? And they have a list. Um, every community has a list, there's other priorities, but there's enough consensus, there's enough projects overall that to find enough consensus around, we can do this. The other thing you heard from was to have accountability. And I certainly haven't heard any opposition to any sort of oversight committee. That's the way um, Wild Spaces Public Places works. I, I think that's a no-brainer. Um, I do believe that there is the possibility of passing a sales tax in our community. And the main things that have to happen to make it work and to be successful is get enough citizen buy-in with enough comprehensive community leadership and buy-in. And here's, here's the, the, the biggest tough part. Everybody has their own list. There's not gonna be enough money for everything. You have to have a list that everybody says, you know what, I don't, it doesn't have everything I want on it, but it's got enough, I can live with that list. And that includes the business community, that includes environmental community, includes the University of Florida. They have to be at the table. They're the largest employer. They certainly drive a lot of the traffic. Um, the neighborhoods have to be at the table, but there has to be enough consensus on the general list that everybody can say it's good enough, let's make it work. And the final thing I wanted to say was about the length of the, the term for a, a sales tax. I do believe it has to run long enough to be able to raise enough money to use it to make a dent in the intense amount of list here. I do think it would have to be closer to 15 years in order to raise enough money to bond the funds and to have enough to make some of the impact you really want to do. If you go too short of a term, you're not going to make enough impact on what you're trying to do. So I do believe it can be done, and I think you have to get enough support from enough of your community to make it happen. Thank you. Steve Shell. Is Steve... Oh. Uh, I'm Melinda Koken. I'm a um, bicyclist, belong to Gainesville Cycling Club. I'm on the com uh, Citizens Advisory Committee of the MTPO, and I had the um, 
privilege of being the past president of Historic Gainesville Incorporated about five years ago. And one of the nice things about Historic Gainesville is that uh, one of their first acts was to save the Thomas Center from being torn down in 1972. Probably you don't know that it was threatened, but it was. And um, uh, people like Roy Hunt and Sam Gowan worked diligently to save it, and now it's like the crown jewel of a historic part of Gainesville that um, sort of creates a walkable community and a wonderful place to live. And I guess because of that, I see um, that the city of Gainesville has the possibility of being a showcase. I'm not just the city, but all of Alachua County being a showcase for uh, transportation growth. And I think it can happen by each one of us here committing ourselves to becoming community organizers and to going out and promoting the idea of uh, whatever it takes to get a tax passed to support uh, the infrastructure and, and creating uh, the, the kind of transportation system that will really underpin all of Alachua County, uh, <clears throat> basically, and, and building a smarter city for everyone who lives here. Thank you. Ed Brady. Steve Shell, um, glad this is called the Transportation Summit. You know transportation is all modes. It's not just roads, it's not just transit. I wanna talk primarily about transit, but, but first I'll tell you that although I'm really in favor of transit, I ride transit every day, I bike every day, I'm not necessarily sold on the idea of expanding or enhancing transit at the expense of road lanes that currently exist. All that said, now, there's been a lot of points that, that I agree with from a lot of speakers up here today, and, and one of those points is the, uh, the idea that as we age, at some point, a lot of us are going to have to stop driving. And a lot of this has been uh, personal experience in my family, and it's a big deal when you can't drive anymore. When you're used to getting in the car and going where you need to go, it's a big deal. Now, if you had an alternative, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but we've created a society where the large majority of us live in places where that alternative doesn't exist and really isn't even practical. So think about that as you go forward. The other thing is there's been a couple comments of, uh, about Gainesville and comparing it to other cities such as Eugene, Portland, places like this. Portland uh, has always been brought up as a, a good example of uh, a city that has really, really good transit and, and by, as a result, has seen a very good quality of life. But Portland didn't sit down and decide, let's have trolleys and let's have trains that go to the suburbs and let's do this with transportation. What they did 40 years ago was decide what kind of a community they wanted to be. They talked about the design of buildings. They talked about the uses of of buildings and, and structures that go together. They talked about the amenities they wanted to have in a community and then they set about building that. And so what I'm saying is you can't look at transportation alone. You have to look at it as part of a big equation that includes things like land use and community design. Um, the final thing I'm gonna say concerns transit. Uh, transit, we'd like to point to transit in Gainesville as being a really major success and I think it is. That's largely because of UF. More specifically, it's largely because of a decision that students made back in the 1990s that said they would like to pay money to be able to have better transit. Those students, probably the large portion of them, are no longer here. So when you hear someone say that students are transient, 
think about the decision they made in the 1990s and how it's benefiting this community to this day. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of UF and, and transit is that they're driving it. The city of Gainesville has a portion of it, and whatever the city funds is the parts that Todd Chase talked about when he mentioned workers downtown having to leave work early because the bus stops running. If you live in an area of the city that's, that's frequented by students, you've got wonderful service. You don't even have to think about what time the bus comes, but if you live on Northwest 6th Street, it's gonna stop at 7 p.m. and it's only gonna run every hour. So you really don't have that kind of an option. One of the staffers I think earlier today talked about um, the county's transit system or proposed transit system and the cities and how they should mesh together sort of seamlessly. I don't think there should be two systems to mesh together seamlessly. I think there should be one. There should be one system that's countywide, not a city part, not a county part. The county in the past at least 20 years has never adequately funded transit in the unincorporated urbanized area. Route 75 is a good example. It's just not adequate out there, but there's serious demand. So what I propose, since I have all the county commission here and I have a large portion of the city commission here, is I think you need to have the conversation as you move forward about establishing a transportation authority or transportation district so that you take RTS out from under the city and you don't ask the county to keep funding route whatever, route whatever, but the city and the county get together and have a conversation, find out how this can work, take it to a transit authority or a transit district with a separate funding source so that now it is no longer a difference between city and county. When, when Todd Chase talked about some areas right up the road that we can't service, when you start talking about some of these places and how close they are, then somebody says, oh, well, that's in the county. Oh, well, so we're only talking about the city. Well, that's in the county. Well, if you want a county-wide system, then I think the best way to do it is a transit district or transit authority. So I've talked to some commissioners individually on both sides of the street about this. I've had varying reactions. Some people think I want to kill puppies. But it's, it's something I think you need to have a conversation on. Have that conversation. Thank you. Troy Hart. I appreciate it appreciate this opportunity to address, um, to address this very important issue of our transportation future. Uh, I think my comments would begin with uh, what I would hope we, there's unanimous agreement among all office holders is that policy should follow preference. In a representative system of government, consensual form of government, what people prefer is where we go with public policy. Um, where people prefer is pretty clear, and the evidence is out there. Most of us express it by we live. We're not, we're not acting against our will and our preference for a low-density, uh, more automobile-oriented future. Uh, it's what we want. And, uh, and it doesn't mean there's not other options, but it should reflect what most people want. Um, the most comprehensive study of this question of preference in which the question is actually given to the respondent and they give their answer, showed overwhelming support. It was the 2001 Community Preference Survey by the National Association of Realtors. Thousands were interviewed from all around the country as a representative sample. On the question of the setting where people prefer, 52% prefer traditional suburbs, small towns, or a rural environment. That's their preference. 28% prefer a suburban setting with mixed uses. Only 8% express, express a preference for a high-density central city environment. On the question of density, which has largely been left out of this discussion, 87% signaled that they prefer privacy from neighbors. Only 7% they said they only 7% said they wanted to be at a place that is quote at the center of it all. On the issue of housing, 80% prefer single-family detached housing. 8% choose 
chose apartments or condominiums as their long-term preference. Even when you drill down on Generation Y, their long-term goals for a majority is single-family homes with a yard. 61% preferred, quote, houses built far apart on larger lots, even if that meant having to drive to get to schools, stores, and restaurants. 37% want houses built close together on small lots. All right. So again, policy should follow preference. Uh, there certainly is a market for the high-density, transit-oriented future, but it's a smaller market. And so any type of transportation long-term plans should reflect that preference. Now, I think it's important also that any way going forward should at least be directed. We should try and clear up some myths. The one myth is that livability means high density, compact development, and transit orientation. That's simply not true. The modern suburbs, suburbs that are built are very walkable. I know I've walked a lot of those in the last several weeks, really. But seriously, wherever you go in the country, we have some of the builders right here in this community who are nationally recognized. They build low density suburbs that are walkable, that are pedestrian friendly, and there's no reason to think that we have to have a diminishment of suburban development. It's also a myth um, to claim that it's roads versus transit, and I think that's where perhaps we really need to get back on track. Roads are inherently multimodal. If you want to promote mass transit, folks, fix the roads. If you want to promote pedestrian activity, fix the roads. If you want more people on bicycles, fix the roads. Roads are multimodal by definition. It also shouldn't be cars versus transit, and uh, because again, it should reflect what people want. Um, there's a lot of more that really should be said, but I'll sum up by just saying, one of the dangers I think we have of getting into is this following this idea of a static transit future rather than a dynamic uh, transit future. There is nothing forward-looking about the year 2035 based on fixed routes, fixed schedules set by faceless bureaucrats. Everything else in our lives is drilling down to individuality, personal choice, ref, uh, responsive and adaptive services. Think about our telecommunications, educational choices, all of those things. Why should transit be any different? The future of mass transit is on demand, smaller fleets, nimble service that go where they're supposed to go, when they're supposed to go. And that should be incorporated in any long-term plans. Thank you. Darlene Piffalo. My name is Troy Hart. I've uh, been a resident of Alachua County and uh, Gainesville for the past six years. I'm here representing Santa Fe Healthcare and the family of Santa Fe Healthcare companies, including AvMed Health Plans, Haven Hospice, uh, Santa Fe Senior Living, and Santa Fe Village, the transit oriented development that is going to be built uh, just uh, uh, east of the interstate and uh, north of uh, 39th Avenue. And uh, many of you may know of Santa Fe already. We have a 40-year history in this community. Uh, got our start as Alachua General Hospital. If we did a show of hands, my guess is that uh, many of you, if not most of you, have received treatment there, and maybe some of you were born there even. Yeah, but someone born there. Uh, and, and change is uh, a fact of life, because now Alachua General Hospital is Innovation Square, right? So um, we know that the issues and challenges that have brought us to this place in our community are not going to be solved by the solutions that were applicable 10, 20, and 30 years ago. We're going to have to do things differently. Um, Santa Fe Healthcare is committed to Gainesville and to Alachua County. We have over 850 employees that uh, reside in Alachua County. We have over 2,000 employees throughout the state. Uh, and frankly, because of the nature of our business, we could locate our business anywhere now. Um, we've chosen to remain a part of this county and, and to maintain our headquarters here, even though we serve people throughout the, the entire state. 
And I think it's fair to say, with the interaction that I have with the employees that uh, I work with directly, and, uh, and just generally from the giving nature of our organization, that both our organization and our employees love this community, and we serve this community, and we're committed to making a difference here uh, every day. And I know that as I speak with people, and, and as I work with our charitable organizations, as we give back to the community, we're involved in virtually every civic organization, every charitable organization, both corporately and by the members of our employee group. Um, we have been working for years to envision the future of this campus I talked about, Santa Fe Village. And, and our motive is not a profit-making motive. It's really to make a community asset for Alachua County. Um, we've participated um, with uh, the development of the transit orientation plan, and uh, we are fully in line with the growth plan of both the county and the city. Uh, we've, um, we have changed our plan as the county's growth plan has changed over time, literally investing millions of dollars into the planning of this new asset for our community. And, uh, and, and our commitment to that development is, is a 30-year commitment. It's long term. Central to our plan has been this new balanced transportation strategy that has been both Gainesville and Alachua counties focus for the last several years. And there are a couple key elements. We've talked about all of them tonight. It includes roads, of course. It includes the maintenance of our existing infrastructure, of course. And it also includes an increased leveraging of transit, including rapid transit, that connects um, Gainesville and Alachua County's largest employers uh, to the rest of our community, which we think is just critical. Um, and as we're speaking right now, and, uh, we are working with county staff to envision that development going forward predicated upon those plans which have been laid. And so what we need organizationally, and what I think all of the businesses that are located in our great community need, is a certainty, and, and I might even call it bankable certainty or predictable certainty as we move forward with this development and try and leverage, as, just as, as the county is trying to leverage and as the city is trying to leverage those dollars, uh, to maximize our transportation value, we need to be able to, to leverage the commitment on both the county and the city's part as we move forward to finance this project. We're willing and able through this project as it moves forward to contribute up to $17 million in multimodal transportation fees to the enhancement of our transportation system. As I know our fellow developments at Celebration Point and, uh, and Spring Hill uh, and others as they come forward will contribute and leverage those resources into the future. And last, uh, what we would ask of the commission and of the city is that our leaders take a long-term approach and make a commitment to developing and funding a unified and effective transportation plan and policy. And that beyond the development of that, that they have the, the fortitude to see the plan into fruition so that we can have the confidence in making that investment as we go forward. And last, on a personal note, I would just say, I have three lovely daughters, two of whom have told me that they'll never live in a city that doesn't have effective mass transit. So for my personal benefit, if we could get this done so that I could have my daughters back, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you. Good evening, my name is Darlene Pafalo. Actually, almost 12 hours ago, I was in Tallahassee talking to Representative Porter, Watson, and Perry. So it's been a long day. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, thank you for allowing this summit. I would just like to touch on a few things that I've heard while I was here from 7 o'clock on. One of the things I heard the home builders speak about was um, to have smaller buses. Um, I can remember when Commissioner Braddy and uh, Dominich were commissioners, and uh, one of the things I brought up when they were talking about transit was to get jitneys. And one of the things I was told then, is about six, seven years ago now, um, that RTS doesn't, you have jitneys, so we can't have them. Um, but I think there's some things called private enterprise that maybe we can get companies to run the business as jitneys 
for the small people, that, the people that need the small trips. Um, I can tell you with jitneys, um, I'm from Atlantic City and that's what they use and it's about a 12 passenger little, little bus. Doesn't get in anybody's way and it's very acceptable for people that need the rides. That's my two cents on that. Um, and also the headways would be faster too because they'd be smaller and they can get around so people wouldn't have to wait as long. I can tell you um, I am from the Philadelphia area. I lit worked in Philadelphia and took the bus every day, every morning. I was at the end of the line so I could sleep going home and they would wake me up to get off the bus. And I was telling that story in Tallahassee. But um, the thing is when you have people that need to ride the bus, you need more than waiting an hour for the next bus. I would wait five minutes and get home. I mean, there was that many buses because of the, the population also that used it. With regards to the um, money, I'm very disappointed in um, the sale gas tax. I was told when we voted in the sales tax, and I don't remember how much it was per gallon that we still pay, that my understanding was that was going to go to roads. But it's not, is it? It's going to other things. And I think that's where the mistrust comes when you're, teach, you're telling us to vote for something because it's really good. We're gonna get, I mean, I try my best not to gas and gain. When I know I'm going out of town, I never fill up in Gainesville. I always go everywhere else but Gainesville. A lot of people do that because of the difference in the tax. The other thing is I don't think $300 million is enough money from the city, I think it was somebody mentioned, for our roads. What is that, not even a quarter of a mile to fix a road, $300, $300 million. I don't know what it costs anymore for roads. Um, one thing was mentioned about the bikes. <clears throat> I can remember 15 years ago when the comprehensive land use plan was coming into effect, everybody in the county was talking about Portland, Oregon. That was the number one city that everybody wanted to be like, Portland, Oregon. Well, you should Google it a little bit more now. It was stated that we're above Portland, Oregon for bikes and all that, but you should also look in Portland, Oregon because they are losing population and closing schools because have the regulations that they have. Go a little bit further on what you're talking about on that because if you want to lose population, follow Portland, Oregon, and you will. And um, two more little things. Uh, about four years ago, I was in uh, Houston, Texas in a conference talking about transportation. And one of the things I had was a light bulb that went on. And I had, I had to call the gentleman because he was in Washington, D.C. He was a national transportation organization in Washington, D.C. And he said, and it made a lot of sense, people are poor because of mass transit because the jobs are not where the buses are. The jobs are outside of where the buses go and more people make better money when they have a car to go to work. Just think about that. That's something to ponder because it, it really, when you think about it, it's really, really true. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Braddy, wherever he is. I've been a realtor, I'm not representing the realtors, but I've been a realtor this year for 40 years. And Commissioner Hawkins, I appreciate what you said about the Common Ground magazine that you get but I can tell you from being out there, kicking bricks, driving people around in my car, hitting all these bumps, that 80% of the people do not want to live in close quarters. They want the backyard, they want the fenced yard for their dog and their children. And the nat what Mr. Brady said is 100% true. So I just have one thing to close on. Um, transportation, fix our roads, period. If I have a leaky roof, do I fix the leak or do I get new carpeting? Thank you. Daniel Westling. Is Paul Loesch here? Paul Loesch? Okay, Daniel, then you are up. And in the queue is Rob Brinkman.
Um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time uh, to come out and um, hope everybody's got an open mind. Um, I think there is a lot of things for agreement. Um, I've lived um, in games. I graduated about 15 years ago. I've lived on University Avenue about the same time. This is the only second time I've ever come to any meetings and spoken. Um, the last one was on 8th Avenue. Um, I'm kind of concerned about the BRT uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, from what I hear, um, in order to get federal funds, you'd have to have uh, dedicated lanes. Um, but I'm going to get to that in a minute, I guess. Um, one of the things that I think about just trying to speak from the heart is the last thing that Darlene said, if you've got a train, it's got to have a track to get to the destination down there. All right. From what I understand, we're half a billion dollars behind in our road repair. So no matter what mode we use, um, if, if roads are truly multimodal, um, that track needs to be sound to get us to where we want to go as a community. And that's one thing that if we are going to have a new um, revenue source, uh, I don't know that it could be done. I know that the referendum just, you know, failed recently. I know there's a dedicated group on both sides who, you know, they want the money um, to go to a certain thing. But if, if we're going to have that new revenue source, would it be available to dedicate, you know, some of the old money that was already there, already being taxed, to say this can go towards these modes or this can go towards the tracks, you know, to keep the tracks sound for everybody to use? Um, because if we're going to have a new revenue source and we could do the same thing, you know, we could dedicate something in the new source, however it's written, which is kind of what was tried before. Um, it failed. Uh, a lot of it, I think, has to do with voter turnout. Everybody, there's a lot of smart people here tonight. And when I mean smart, I'm, I'm talking about intelligent people and people that care, you know, but a lot, a lot of people show up to vote. And uh, if we look at what's happened over the last 20 years, um, you know, that I've been living here, um, th I've seen some, uh, really good things that we've done with our roads, but if you look at that number, the math just doesn't lie. I mean, that's a lot of money that we're already in the hole. Um, and somebody had a Darwin quote, you know, they were talking about adapting to change. Well, math doesn't change. You know, the black and white of it is that you have a certain percentage that, you know, a certain number that you're either going to be in the black or the white, or I should say the black or the red. And we are deep in the red, really, in, in my opinion, compared to the new things that we are talking about spending money on in the new revenue. So I, I just personally think that there should be a percentage of that that would go to keeping the track there for everybody to use, no matter if they're on, I don't know what you call those things, you know, the old timers that go back and forth that doesn't actually have a motor in it, whatever it is that you choose you know, as your source, and I said last time when I was a student, I rode my bike every day. Um, I'm basically a blue collar worker now, so my hours are about 10 hours a day. Um, and I live about 10 miles from work, so, I mean, there's the math again. It's kind of hard for me to bike nowadays, and I'm getting a little older too. My knees are a little shot, but um, that, that's just one of the things that I hope people keep an open mind is that you know, we are a community, people talk about that, and let's try and think of it as a, as a track here and not get too far ahead of ourselves in a new big project, you know, and jump into it. Uh, maybe I, I had a conversation earlier today where I was talking about instead of dump, jumping in head first without checking the depth, let's put, you know, a toe in the water or an ankle in the water maybe split this thing up too as far as the revenue. I know that's one of the battles that was going on when that referendum failed is that there was only a certain amount of money by law from the state of Florida that we could, you know, use for transportation in, in different ways. And that's, I think, where a lot of the friction came and that's what brought us to where we are right now. So um, I, I guess I'll just wrap up and say that uh, hopefully, you know, people keep an open mind about the track and maybe the percentages we could maybe dedicate, which you might say it failed last time, but if people aren't so partisan, and by the way, I'm an equal opportunity hater. I hate the Democrats and the Republicans equally. Not really hate. I, I shouldn't use that word, but 
Um, I, don't, I don't like partisanship. Um, people have strong opinions, and I think that's what makes the country great, so thanks. Matt Serenzi. Good evening, my name is Rob Brinkman. And uh, I've been involved in transportation issues for many years, served eight years on the Citizens Advisory Committee to the NTPO, currently the Vice Chair. And I was really encouraged a few years back, it was 2009 I believe, I was involved in the statewide Sierra Club at the time and one of the uh, statewide priorities that year was using transit to solve transportation needs rather than building more roads because frankly it's the only thing that is going to be sustainable in the long term and I was very happy because that was basically the county's policy at that time that was the thing unfortunately the county kind of briefly took a wrong turn in the interim and frankly I'm glad the sales tax failed because I think it was the wrong thing. I don't think it would have been the solution this community needs. Now, I want to respond to some of the things I've heard tonight. One was the idea that people prefer to live out in suburbs and in rural areas. Well, you know, the problem with that is during the history of this country, people have been moving into cities. The rural population continues to dwindle. The uh, Metropolitan populations continue to grow. So I think there's a, a, a problem with that logic. I think we have to be careful about using survey data that's frankly dated. The other is this idea that people don't trust the government, and that's why they won't vote for a tax increase. Well, the funny thing is, people have now twice now voted to increase the millage rate for schools. They obviously trust the school board. They've actually uh, two or three times now passed taxes for land conservation. They obviously trusted the government to spend the money as it said it would, and the government did. There's this perception that the gas tax, which by the way was not voted on in a public referendum that was passed by the county commission, they're the only ones who can levy the gas tax, um, was not spent as it's, they said it was. Well, I think people had an idea of what they thought the gas tax should be spent for, but that's not what the gas tax is supposed to be spent for. It was, in fact, every penny of it spent as the law requires, because you don't spend money, government money, in violation of the law without getting yourself in a lot of trouble. And, you know, People exaggerate how much goes to things like bike lanes or sidewalks. It's a very small sliver. One of the problems people says, well, why didn't it fix all the roads? Well, you know, we built an awful lot of roads back when gas was cheap. And by gas, I'm also referring to oil because that's what you basically used to make oil. I was reflecting that 40 years ago, uh, when I was graduating high school, gasoline basically cost on the order of one-tenth of what it costs today. And that's when we built a lot of the roads, and it was cheap to build the roads back then, it was cheap to maintain the roads. So what's happened in the interim? Gasoline's gotten a lot more expensive. Cars have gotten a lot more efficient. People are actually driving fewer miles. Vehicle miles traveled is being, is gone down, and cars are getting more efficient, so they're using even less gasoline. And the gas, gas tax is not based on the price of gas, it's based on the gallons sold. So the actual gas tax revenues have been declining as a function of how much revenue is being levied. At the same time, what's happened to the price of oil? It's hugely increased, which means the cost of building and maintaining roads has hugely increased. So the problem is most all the gas tax is going to build roads or maintain roads. It's not going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. Property tax levies would not be enough. Um, essentially, I think sales tax is the pot of money which will generate enough money and it does have the advantage of collecting money from people who are just traveling through your community, who work in other communities, who live in other communities but work here. And you know, I, I have to say this on the subject of the price of gasoline. I was down in Tampa a couple weeks ago, bought gas for three fifty one a gallon, came up that was on Saturday. On Monday, I bought gas in Gainesville at Wilderson Road in the interstate 
for $3.52 a gallon. The gas taxes are not lower in the surrounding area. They're all the same in this area. Every county is levying the same gas tax. It's a misnomer that you can, you can go outside of Gainesville and get cheaper gas because the tax is lower. It's about the market. I hope that this community will continue on the path it was on before, mixed use of, of transportation and roads. Paul Saud. Good evening. I'm Matt Cernsey. I'm the mayor of the city of Hawthorne and also the president of the Lotcher County League of Cities. Uh, thank you all for being here, and I apologize about being underdressed tonight. I left straight from work, went to senior night at the high school baseball field, and then came, came straight here, so I apologize about being late. And I know all the people that were here packing out the room of going home and now watching it on TV or on the recording tomorrow, so, uh, so it does good justice being here. But I thank you all for having this discussion because obviously there's a problem with transportation, and the only way to solve the problem is to talk about it. So that's one of the problems with the last few issues that we've had uh, uh, with the solutions that we've had is not everybody has been at the table all at the same time. And I urge you to keep on that path as getting everybody at the table the entire time instead of just having one person at a time here and there. Um, I know last time we put our uh, list together and just sent them in. Well, get us to, at the table and let us talk about it together. I know at all of our Logic County League of Cities meetings, we have all nine cities sitting there around a the table talking about important issues uh, to us in our county. And we're all a little bit unique, uh, believe it or not. So I, I urge you to uh, continue doing that. Um, and, the, and, the, and the part being about the plans, uh, each city is a little bit different. We all know what's important to our cities, uh, what issues that we have, and what is our priority as far as road paving. Let us, let us decide what that is. We involved our public in Hawthorne. We involved our citizens in identifying the roads um, and setting our priorities. We had workshops there. So we have a good representation of what would work for our community. Many of the other cities did the same thing. Um, so we have a working document. Also, we need right now just basically good leadership from all of the representatives in all different uh, aspects of the community, whether it's city government, whether it's in uh, the Chamber of Commerce or other places to come together, find common ground on things that we agree on. I've heard that several times. It was common ground and trust. We get common ground together on issues that we agree on and work from there. It may not be everything that we want. Uh, what they say is plan big and start small. All right, have a good plan for the future of what you want to do eventually. Go ahead and uh, get what you can get right now as far as starting. Have your priorities set. Uh, for instance, I like using this uh, representation and uh, bragging on our city a little bit because we haven't always been the best in the area, uh, but we are on our way to doing that now. Is that now we had, the city of Hawthorne needed an expansion of our sewer system. Well, we had a 500,000 gallon uh, uh, system that we could have expanded to, but we couldn't afford that. So what did we do? We expanded to fi uh, another 50,000 gallons, so we're up to 200,000 gallons now, but we have plans on the shelf to make it up to 500,000 gallons. So we have a shovel-ready project. So as soon as we get what, uh, the development needed, then we'll have the expansion necessary uh, to, to suit all of them. So have your projects ready, have the expansion ready. If it's uh, a, trans a transit uh, issue, uh, have, a, have a big plan, but maybe start out and show that uh, there is need in one area, and then people will probably get jealous of that, and they'll want it in their area and then they'll extend the tax or, um, or come back and find ways to get that at other places. So start small, uh, or start, start planning big, but start small. Uh, and I invite you to uh, keep, keep us engaged, keep everybody engaged. This is nice to have everybody talking here and to have everybody's opinions. This is obviously a passionate issue and a local issue uh, for all of the communities. So I thank you again for having us here. Uh, on behalf of all the cities uh, in the county, we all want to be involved in the uh, resolution of this. So thank you again uh, for having me and all the citizens here as well. Thank you. Hello. 
I'm Paul Sog. I live out in High Springs. I live a mile from the county line, and uh, I kind of wish that I'd put my house a mile down the road because my taxes would be half. But I can't do that. I've lived out there since '85, and uh, I don't know. I've been to the commission meetings quite a bit. Some of these people know me. In 2003, they put it on the ballot, and the voters voted that they did not want a five cent gas tax. They found out that 82% or 52% goes to the county, 38% goes to the city of Gainesville. Gainesville wanted to put in sidewalks, trails, and shore up the bus company. Now the people voted it down. But then in 2007, the commission decided, well, we'll just slip it in there. So we got the five cent gas tax, and it was supposed to fix the roads. Now I ride a big Harley, and if you go out Main Street and High Springs, you'll lose your teeth. They just fall out. If you go out by Santa Fe High School, that road going out towards uh, the county line, you don't even want to walk it. It's that bad. So, you know, I think that maybe if we take and concentrate the money that we've collected and put it on the roads and then let the bus company earn their money. They, Wednesday, I was down at the doctor's office, went over to Burger King, 10.30 in the morning. Six buses came from right up, right up the road, from Sears, I guess. And neither one, not one of the six buses had more than four people on it at 10.30 in the morning. I think that we need to re redo the routes, cut the buses, or, you know, have less buses, or something ain't right. Um, I don't know, you know, it's easy for me to sit there and drink coffee and say that bus ain't got three people on it. You know, uh, I pay a lot of taxes in Latcher County. I live on five acres. I got a big black Harley, and I'm on Social Security. And the only reason I make that work is because I cut a lot of corners. Now, they did boot, when they first got the money, the five cent tax, they did repay pay Post Spring Road. But before they got done, they took core borings in the road. There's one spot there that's got four core borings, six inch holes like this here, right in the road, boom, 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 boom. Uh, you really don't want to ride a motorcycle when you get out of Gainesville. That's the best I can tell you. And uh, I don't know, as far as the taxing goes, Mr. Pinkerson will tell you many times I've been there and I'm saying that 50% of the property in Latchua County is owned by the churches and by the university. They pay no tax. We need to get these people to loosen up their money. They are all businesses. They're not, uh, they're not in it for the nonprofit. They should be paying their share. Other than that, you know, I'm just an old farm boy. I don't know what else to tell you. You know, the way you get the mule's attention is you take a two by four and hit them between the ears. And that's what needs to be done in Lancaster County. And on that note, <laughs> we started out with a full house. We all heard what had to be said. Thank you, all of you who have stuck around to the, to the bitter end. This is it for tonight. On June 4th, we will reconvene at the County Commission Chambers. Everyone who was here tonight, if they gave us their email address, took a, a, a specific reminder of that meeting. It will obviously be advertised and so on and so forth. Thank you so much for sticking around with us tonight and safe travels going home tonight. Good night, everybody.